right, y'all. Peace and blessings. God bless you all. I'm Jarvis Kingston, and I hope that y'all doing all right, staying strong and solid in these times that run. I pray that you have repented and that you are baptized. I pray that you are safe, protected, and prayed up. And I just hope that whatever situation that you're going through, that the Lord is with you, that he guides you, he protects you, he looks out for you, he comforts you. I pray that you keep being more strong and wise for the Lord. I pray that you stay in his presence, you stay prayed up. And I just hope that your mental health gets better along the way because um, there's so much going on all four corners of the earth. There's so much going on in the world. There's probably a lot going on in your personal life, but blessed is the person who trusts in the Lord. Blessed is the person whose hope is in the Lord. Amen. So you have to keep fighting a good fight of faith and you have to stay on that narrow path and stop backsliding, turn from your ways, and you have to keep your eyes fixed on the prize. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Let us thank the Lord for another day. Let us thank the Lord for waking us up. Let us thank the Lord for giving us another day, another chance. Let us thank the Lord for food in our belly, clothes on our back, a roof over our head. Let us thank the Lord for protecting us coming in and coming out. And let's just thank him for everything above and beyond that we probably do not see. Amen. God protects us in a lot of ways that we just don't understand or see. He does work in mysterious ways. So we always have to have faith and trust in him through it all. Okay. Your situation might look a little crazy right now, but it's going to look beautiful after you go through that trial and tribulation, after that hardship, after those tests. Uh, you're going to definitely have a testimony about it. You're going to be able to be glad and rejoice and share it with everyone. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Welcome, family. Greetings, body of Christ. Shalom, everybody. I thank you all for listening. I appreciate you guys for supporting. I love you all so much. Praying for you all. We have to constantly uplift one another in Christ. We have to encourage one another. Iron sharpens iron. Merry heart, gladness, joy, and all in all, edification, okay? We have to keep learning and empowering one another in Christ, and we have to always make sure we pull each other up and not pull each other down or tear each other down. We have to uplift one another just as the Lord would want us to, all right? Have that unity and harmony, peace and love, amen? Walk in strength. There's strength in numbers, all right? Yes, yes, y'all. Welcome all peoples, all nations, all tribes, all languages, all tongues, all four corners of the earth, all faces, all races. Yes, yes, y'all. All four corners of earth, I love you all, man. Whether you're chosen or adopted, it is all right. Whether you are Israelite or Gentile, it is all right. Let us gather, praise the Lord, let us come together, fellowship, and be in love. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. Let us love the Lord our God, Father, of our mind, heart, soul, strength, and might. Let us love our neighbors as we love ourselves. And let us always know the Lord better and obey the gospel, obey the laws, his commandments, obey his full word, and be doers of the word, all right? Let us do Father's business and Father's will for the rest of our lives until Jesus comes back, okay? Jesus is coming back like a thief in the night. He is coming back for a church with no spot, no blemish, no wrinkle. He is coming back in an hour no one knows but only the Father, all right? So let us stay ready. Let us stay, keep working until he comes back, okay? Let us look out for the widows, the strangers, the poor people. Um, and anybody, just look out for anybody. Be helpful and generous as much as you can along your journey with what you have, okay? Um, if you have, make sure you give and share. If you don't have, um, just ask the Lord for more resources and help so that way you could be able to bless others with it along your journey, amen? Yes, yes, y'all. So in today's message, we are going to continue the Bible reading series, all right? Yesterday, we finished and completed the book of Romans reading. Now we are in the book of First Corinthians, all right? So we are now going to get into the first Corinthians and go from there. We will close out with a priestly blessing. We will close out with a prayer. And we'll also close out with um, giving all the praise, honor, and glory to the most high God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And praising his only begotten son who died for our sins. Amen. Yes, yes. So the book of Romans was a very excellent read. So I'm looking forward to getting into first Corinthians as well. All right. So before we get into the book of first Corinthians chapter one, we're going to read the introduction of it. And then go from there, okay? So here we go. All right, here we go with the commentary of Essentials of First Corinthians. Arthur, the Apostle Paul, audience, the church at Corinth, the date about A.D. 55, the setting, the church in the Greek city of Corinth, started by Paul during his second missionary journey, grapples with the sins of sexual immorality and idolatry prevalent throughout the city. Essentials of First Corinthians. The church in Corinth serves a biblical serves as biblical exhibit A. It shows evidence of anonymous potential in troubled times and of great promise amid chaos. Planted within one of the most culturally diverse cities of the ancient world, the church finds it difficult finds it difficult to keep the negative influences of society at bay. Many in the Corinthian church bring their pagan baggage into the church, and some don't want to get rid of it. The, re this, the resulting division and disorder threaten to tear the church apart. Paul's first letter to these believers mixes love and confrontation with wise consultation. 
He addresses their problems and answers several questions the church raises with him. As you read 1 Corinthians, notice how Paul's words overflow with the tough love of a godly leader. While you might feel awkward reading the details of this group's dirty laundry, you'll quickly recognize these familiar problems because they continue to plague the church and the lives of Christians today. We still need the wise counsel God provides through this letter. What to look for in 1 Corinthians, healthy doses of tough love, practical patterns for spiritual problem solving, the dangers of spiritual fan clubs in church, how the human body symbolizes a healthy church, a tribute to faith, hope, and love, the importance of the resurrection. All right, y'all. The book of Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, here we go. Paul called to be an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God and our brothers Sethenus to the church of God at Corinth, to those sanctified in Christ Jesus and called to be holy together with all those, everyone, everywhere who call on the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. Grace and peace to you from God, our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Thanksgiving. I always thank God for you because of his grace given you in Christ Jesus, for in him, you have been enriched in every way, in all your speaking and in all your knowledge, because our testimony about Christ was confirmed in you. Therefore, you do not lack any spiritual gift as you eagerly wait for our Lord Jesus Christ to be revealed. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. God, who has called you to fellowship with his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, is faithful. Divisions in the church. I appeal to you, brothers, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another so that there may be no divisions among you and that you may be perfectly united in mind and thought. My brothers, some from Chloe's household have informed me that there are quarrels among you. What I mean is this. One of you says, I follow Paul. Another says, I follow Apollos. Another says, I follow Cephas. Still another says, I follow Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Were you baptized into the name of Paul? I am thankful that I did not baptize any of you except Crispus and Gaius. So no one can say that you were baptized into my name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I don't remember if I baptized anyone else. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, not with words of human wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. Christ, the wisdom and power of God. For the message of the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, the intelligence of the intelligent, I will frustrate. Where is the wise man? Where is the scholar? Where is the philosopher of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know him. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Jews demand miraculous signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Hmm. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man's wisdom and the weakness of God is stronger than man's strength. Hmm. Brothers, think of what you were when you were called. Not many of you were wise by human standards. Not many were influential, influential. Not many were of noble birth, but God chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. He chose the lowly things of this world and the despised things and the despised and the things that are not to nullify the things that are so that no one may boast before him. It is because of him that you are in Christ Jesus, who has become for us from God. That is our righteousness to illness our righteousness, holiness, and redemption. Therefore, as it is written, let him who boast, boast in the Lord. Yes, yes, amen. That is the book of First Corinthians chapter one. You know, Paul writes these letters and be preaching, man. He be he be going off right out the gate. <laughs> Paul be going off from the jump, man. So he really get to it in his gospel and how he goes about things, okay? And I would like to read this um, in commentary scripture within the book of First Corinthians chapter one. Um, it says, God keeps us strong. First Corinthians chapter one, verse eight. He will keep you strong to the end so that you will be blameless on the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. All right. So as we review first Corinthians chapter one, Paul is just greeting his people in Corinth. All right. So he's in a different part of Greece, um, just preaching and doing his thing. 
and what have you. He's also just giving thanksgiving and giving glory to God and being appreciative of those um, he's able to deal with and uh, tell his testimony about Christ with, all right? And then he's also going further to the divisions of the church, all right? So back, of course, in ancient times, there was all types of divisions among different beliefs from different groups of people, and that still exists to this day, okay? So Paul was just trying to bring unity in the house of God. He was trying to bring that uh, harmony and good chemistry within one another and putting aside differences of pride, okay? Because he was basically saying how one was following Paul, the other was following Apollos, another was following Cephas, and the other was following Christ. But Paul's whole thing was to, to make sure everybody follows Christ, all right, and to not follow anybody else. Christ is the way, truth, and life. That's the only example you follow. You don't follow nobody and nothing else. Amen. So that's what Paul was just basically getting at and making sure that, that there be no division because Christ is not divided, neither should anybody be about their beliefs as well, okay? And he was just talking about baptism a little bit as well. And he said that he wasn't called to baptize. He was just called to preach the gospel. So Paul stood in his lane and stuck to it. He didn't try to do something that wasn't um, his calling. Okay, so it's important to have awareness to know what you were called to do and stick to it, stick to the assignment, and not try to do what others are doing. Okay, so as we go further into 1 Corinthians chapter 1, um, Paul just goes more further to detail about Christ, the wisdom, and the power of God. And you know, he basically summed it up by saying like, hey, you know, he came to, you know, he chose the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. And God chose the weak things of the world to shame the strong. And that's a very beautiful, uh, pure statement because we've seen that over and over all throughout history. You know, God used King David to, you know, take out Goliath. You know what I mean? <laughs> you know, and God, it's, there's plenty of examples of God just using the small out of things or the small out of people and making so much out of it. Amen. So over and over, we see that throughout our lifetime. All right. And even in these end times that we're in, um, God is going to use the prostitutes, the tax collectors, the carnal people, people who had a wild life in the past. He's going to use them to spread the gospel. And he's going to use people who came from all walks of life, all types of brokenness or shocks or traumas or just, you know, a crazy life. People who probably been in and out of jail or people who lived a rough life, or people who did all types of crazy, sinful things, he's going to use them to spread the gospel, give him glory, even like all of us, me, you, all of us. We all have crazy past or lifestyles from we're coming from or what have you. So he's going to use us to um, declare how great God is and declare the gospel, declare his son, and so forth and so forth. Amen. So that's a very true statement that Paul was saying, all right? So that sums up the book of First Corinthians chapter 1 reading, okay? Now... Let us go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, all right? The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, here we go. When I came to you, brothers, I did not come with eloquence or superior wisdom as I proclaimed to you the testimony about God. For I resolved to know nothing while I was with you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. I came to you in weakness and fear and with much trembling. My message and my preaching were not with wise and persuasive words, but with the demonstration of the Spirit's power, so that your faith might not rest on men's wisdom, but on God's power. Wisdom from the Spirit. We do, however, speak a message of wisdom among the mature, but not the wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age, who are coming to nothing. No, we speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began. None of the rulers of this age understood it, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. However, as it is written, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed it to us by his spirit. The spirit searches all things, even the deep things of God. For who among men knows the thoughts of a man except the man's spirit within him? In the same way, no one knows the thoughts of God except the Spirit of God. We have not accept, we, we have not received the Spirit of the world, but the Spirit who is from God, that we may understand what God has freely given us. This is what we speak, not in words taught us by, taught to us by human wisdom, but in words taught by the Spirit, expressing spiritual truths and spiritual words. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them, because they are spiritually discerned. The, 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 the spiritual man makes judgments about all things, but he himself is not subject to any man's judgment. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ. 
All right. So that is the book of First Corinthians chapter two reading. All right. So as we review that, Paul is just going into further detail about how true wisdom truly comes from the spirit and how our, our wisdom and everything comes from the Lord and not of this world. We don't have a man-made view of things. We don't have a man-made perspective or a worldly carnal approach to evaluate things. Um, the spirit is what guides us and searches all things and let us, it gives us the insight on all things. It says all things. So um, the Holy Spirit can let us know about many things um, that a carnal person cannot understand. You get what I'm saying? As Paul is, that's basically what Paul is getting at. But you remember, um, the scripture does say that the ways of the Lord, his ways higher than our ways, his thoughts higher than our thoughts. So the Lord does always keep a way of humbling us or what have you. But when the Lord pours out his spirit, he pours out his wisdom. Um, there's no limit of political correctness about it. All right. When we're moved by the spirit and by the true wisdom, um, we're able to see things better. We're able to see our lives better. We're able to see the Lord better and fear him more and live a better life. We're able to treat people better as well. See, but people who are worldly and have carnal wisdom, um, they're very limited in their ways of viewing things. So this world is full of people with worldly approaches to things and worldly attitudes, you know, that which causes more problems. There's only a few people out here who truly have the spirit, who truly have that that wisdom from the most high. And Paul's just going further and saying how we're expressive about spiritual truths and spiritual words and that... Um, a man without the spirit does not accept the things that come from the spirit of God, their foolishness to him. So that's why when you're dealing with atheists or scoffers or mockers or people who ridicule the faith, um, that comes along with it because most people just don't get it. You could preach all day long, spread the word all day long, but um, it's just going to fall a lot of deaf ears, okay? As long as you could get those few with just those some about it, that's all that matters, okay? So always be mindful of that. Don't be so worked up when someone doesn't accept the faith or receive the words that you give them because... Um, is his foolishness to him, okay? And that we don't, we, and always remember that we have the mind of Christ. So we have to be Christ like in our mind, in our attitudes, in our actions, in our approach, and how we treat people and everything, okay? So it's very important that we be Christ like, uh, right? On all angles, okay? So that's the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2 reading. Before I go into 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I'd like to read this commentary that was within chapter 2, okay? So let us go through with this commentary. Today's Bible reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Recommended reading, Proverbs chapter 1, verses 1 through 7. Also, Proverbs chapter 2, uh, at verse 4. And for and chapter, Proverbs chapter 4 as well, okay? So, let's go. The title of this commentary is Operating System. All right, so here we go. Okay, operating system. Do you stay up on New Year's Eve to wait for the clock to strike midnight? If you do, you probably don't care that much about when the New Year begins in places like Fiji or Auckland, New Zealand. However, you probably cared a bit more on December 31st, 1999, as TV cameras captured the stroke of midnight in those locations to see whether the world has avoided the Y2K disaster as clock struck 12 1201-1202 in each time zone around the world. We all breathed breath a collective sigh of relief that television still functioned, nuclear power plants hadn't failed, and cars continued running. Remember the craziness that preceded Y2K? Companies and governments spent billions of dollars to hire software programmers to pour over and correct millions of lines, computer code, all because of a looming catastrophe if computers were to misread the last two zeros in the year 2000 as 1900. Ironically, most of us have zero understanding of computer code. The Apostle Paul said that wisdom is much the same way. Unless we have the Holy Spirit to help us know the language of God's wisdom, we won't really understand it. The man without the Spirit does not accept the things that come from the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 14, people who don't have the Holy Spirit dwelling within them quite naturally struggle to grasp spiritual wisdom, God's word. His desires, his character, his values, in fact, God's wisdom often seems foolish to non-Christians. It's like a foreign language to them. But when people trust in Christ as Savior, God sends the Holy Spirit to dwell within them. See John chapter 4, verses 16 through 17. They can begin learning God's wisdom while the Holy Spirit helps them understand it. If we believe that true wisdom comes only from God, 
Where should we turn when we seek wisdom? Paul provides the answer, no eye has seen, no ear has heard, no mind has conceived what God has prepared for those who love him, but God has revealed it to us by his spirit, verses 9 through 10. In the Bible, God speaks the language that drives us, our spiritual operating system. If we want to know God's wisdom so that we can process the joys and trials of everyday living, we need to turn often to God's word and ask the spirit to help us understand it. Amen. Things to take away from this commentary. Do you ever struggle to understand thoughts and concepts from the Bible? How do you think the Holy Spirit can help? As you Are you growing in your understanding of God and spiritual truth? When was the last time you asked the Spirit to help you understand God's word? What practical steps can you take to grow in God's wisdom? All right, so that's a very good commentary right there. Something to reflect on, okay? All right, so now... Let us go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3. All right. Chapter 3, here we go. On divisions in the church. Brothers, I could not address you as spiritual, but as worldly, mere infants in Christ. I gave you milk, not solid food, for you were not yet ready for it. Indeed, you are still not ready. You are still worldly. For since there is jealousy and quarreling among you, are you not worldly? Are you not acting like mere men? Mere men, for when one says, I follow Paul, and another says, I follow Apollos, are you not mere men? What, after all, is Apollos, and what is Paul? Only servants, through whom you came to believe, as the Lord has assigned to each his task. I planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. So neither he who plants nor he who waters is anything, but only God, who makes things grow. The man who plants and the man who waters have one purpose, and each will be rewarded according to his own labor. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I laid a foundation as an expert builder and someone else building on it. But each one should be careful how he builds. For no one can lay on any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is because the day will bring it to light. Mm. It will be revealed with fire and the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. If it is burned up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one escaping through the flames. Don't you know that you yourselves are God's temple, and that God's spirit lives in you? If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple. Do not deceive yourselves. If any one of you thinks he is wise by the standards of this age, he should become a fool, so that he may become wise. For the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight. As it is written, he catches the wise men in their craftiness. And again, the Lord knows that the thoughts of the wise are futile. So then no more boasting about men. Hmm. All things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Cephas or the world or life or death or the present or the future, all are yours. And you are of Christ and Christ is of God. Okay, so that is the book of First Corinthians chapter three reading. All right. So Paul is going further into detail about the divisions in the church again. All right. It's something you had to always address. And he was just going in about how. People, y'all basically babies in Christ. Y'all not even mature or or ready or grown yet to actually do the works of God because you're still worldly. You're still living a worldly way, a worldly lifestyle, having a worldly view and approach to things. And you still have jealousy and crawling within you, among you. He's basically saying like, well, hey, you can't just pick a side of uh, you're going to follow Paul or follow Apollos. You have to, everything has to always be centered around Christ. You know, he's just basically saying how, like, yeah, he planted a seed and Apollos watered it, but God made it grow. You know, he's just saying, like, everything goes back to God who makes things grow. It's all up to the most high at the end of the day because you can't worship man. Okay, You only worship the creator. All right. Every person on earth is flawed. That's why we don't worship each other or worship people. You could respect a person's work or respect what they do, but don't worship them. Okay, that's basically what Paul was getting at. All right. And then uh, Paul's just expressing how... Um, you know, he's just saying like, hey, you know, we're all going to be rewarded for according to our labor. And he says that we are our, we are God's fellow workers and you are God's field, God's building. And he's just saying by the grace of God, um, by the grace God has given him a foundation to be an expert builder and to be careful how one builds his foundation. Because if the foundation is not really built in Jesus Christ, then um, it's worthless. and It'll be burned up. 
uh, be tested, you know. And that's a very powerful thing because um, what Paul is really addressing was a lot of these ministries, or organizations, these churches. And um, as we see today, this is a problem in ancient times. This is even more of a problem today. Most people don't base their church, their foundation of their church or ministry within God, within Christ. Um, they base it around materialism. They base it around how much church members they have or how big their church is or how much followers they have or um, validation, man-seeking type of things. And Paul is trying to say, like, hey, this foundation has to be within, laid within that's already laid within Jesus Christ. It can't be laid, uh, it can't be, the foundation can't be anything else because, um, you know, if it's if the foundation is using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, wood, hay, or straw, um, the work will be shown for what it is, and and the, the day of judgment will bring it to light, and it will be revealed with fire, because the fire will test the quality of each man's work. If what he built survives, he will receive his reward. If if what he if he, if what he built was burnt up, he will suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as the one who escaped the, through the flames. So. He's like, y'all be careful what y'all build out there, okay? And when we look at a lot of churches and ministries today worldwide, um, there's, there's there's some few good ministries and churches that really is based within Jesus Christ and the foundation of it. And a lot of other churches and ministries or, things, or movements people have, organizations, um, is built out of selfish ambition. It's built out of materialism, money-hungry stuff, carnal stuff, um, you know, very superficial external things, man. And... Um, no, they're gonna get their judgment for that. All right, so y'all be wise and careful out there, okay? Y'all be careful, okay? And then Paul goes further into detail about um, how our bodies are God's temple, and that God's spirit lives in us, okay? And that if anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him, for God's temple is sacred, and you are that temple, you know. So gotta understand man we gotta keep it holy man all right a lot of times me you a lot of us we we're, we have such a a sluggish way or, or going through the most type of way of going about things but we're we're holy we're sacred all right god made our bodies and temples this way we have to honor it and respect the most high with it you can't just disregard it dishonor it what have you all right so let us do better in our everyday lives okay and then furthermore uh paul just goes into detail about saying like hey you know um he also says, do not deceive yourselves. He says, don't think that any of you are wise by standards of this age, you know. He says that he should become a fool so that he may become wise. He says that the wisdom of this world is foolishness in God's sight, you know. And it's interesting because Jesus says something similar. Jesus said the things that people hold regard high to or what people honor and praise is detestable in God's sight. So it's a very powerful saying that Jesus and Paul is saying as well, okay. And furthermore, he's just saying, like, hey, man, you know, um, all in all, you are Christ, and Christ is of God. All right, so only boast in the Lord, people, only, okay? Always, all right? So that's the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 3, reading review, okay? Now let us go to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 4, all right? Chapter 4, here we go. Apostles of Christ. So then men ought to regard as... Regard us as servants of Christ and as those entrusted with the secret things of God. Now, it is required that those who have been given a trust must prove faithful. I care very little if I am judged by you or by any human court. Indeed, I do not even judge myself. My conscience is clear, but that does not make me innocent. It is the Lord who judges me. Therefore, judge nothing before the appointed time. Wait till the Lord comes. He will bring to light what is hidden in darkness and will expose the motives of men's hearts. At that time, each will receive his praise from God. Now, brothers, I have applied these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit, so that you may learn from us the meaning of the saying, do not go beyond what is written. Then you will, take, then you will not take pride in one man over against another. For who makes you different from anyone else? What what do you have that you did not receive? And if you did receive it, why do you boast as though you did not? Already you have all you want. Already you have become rich. You have become kings and that without us, how I wish that you really had become kings so that we might be kings with you. 
For it seems to me that God has put us apostles on display at the end of the procession, like men condemned to die in the arena. We have been made a spectacle to the whole universe, to angels as well as to men. We are fools for Christ, but you are so wise in Christ. We are weak, but you are strong. You are honored. We are dishonored. To this very hour, we go hungry and thirsty. We are in rags. We are brutally treated. We are homeless. We work hard with our own hands. We are cursed. We bless. When we are persecuted, we endure. We endure it. When we are slandered, we answer kindly. Up to this moment, we have become the scum of the earth, the refuse of the world. Hmm. I am not writing this to shame you, but to warn you as my dear children. Even though you have 10,000 guardians in Christ, you do not have many fathers. For in Christ Jesus, I became your father through the gospel. Therefore, I urge you to imitate me. For this reason, I am sending you to Timothy, my son, whom I love, who is faithful in the Lord. He will remind you of my way of life in Christ Jesus, which agrees with that with what I teach everywhere in every church. Some of you have become arrogant as if I were not coming to you, but I will come to you very soon if the Lord is willing. And then I will find out not only how these arrogant people are talking, but what power they have for the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Mm. What do you prefer? Shall I come to you with a whip or in love and with a gentle spirit? Mm. Interesting read. Okay, so that's chapter four. Okay, chapter four is a very interesting read as you review it. Uh, Paul's just going more further to detail about apostleship and being apostles of Christ and that um, we shouldn't be so critical judgmental of other people because um, the Lord is the true judge at the end of the day. The Bible does talk about righteous judgment, not being a hypocrite judgment, taking a speck out of your own eye before you judge your brother, what have you. But uh, Paul's just saying that the true, true judgment really comes from the Lord at the end of the day. The Lord does weigh the hearts as the book of Proverbs says. And, um, He's also just stressing to not go beyond what is written and that you don't take pride in man over against another. So basically, don't be prideful about picking one over another is basically what Paul is getting at. All right. And Paul just goes more further to detail about people's conditions as apostles and the things some people go through while serving God. How some people serve God homeless. Some people serve God being persecuted or separated or mocked or being a scum of the earth, all types of things. So there's all types of peoples, all types of statuses serving God, whether someone's like living lowly in a lowly state or not really having it all together, or if there's someone who lives kind of decent or what have you. Everybody has different ways of um, different conditions that they're in while they're serving. All right. So that's basically what Paul is just stressing to them within First Corinthians chapter four. And he's also going to um, he talks about sending you to his son Timothy, all right? And he's basically saying how Timothy is faithful in the Lord, and he will straighten y'all out with some doctrine in the way of life of Christ in every church that there is as well, okay? So um, Paul also went in and said, well, hey, you know, the kingdom of God is not a matter of talk, but of power. Whew. So the actions, man, the actions are everything, the power of God. People have to see it, feel it, taste it, know it, what have you. All right. It's not just all talk, idle talk and empty sayings. It's, it's power. Okay. It's power in, from the Lord, power in the blood of Jesus, power in doing an obedience. There's power in all of that. All right. So Paul is really going in about it. Okay. So that is the book of first Corinthians chapter four reading. I would like to read the commentary scripture that's within Corinthians four. It says, God causes spiritual growth, 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 7. So neither he who plants or he who waters is anything, but only God who makes things grow. Amen. God's the one that makes things grow at the end of the day. Nobody or nothing else, only the Lord. Amen. But the Lord's will be done forevermore. All right, all right. So let us go into 1 Corinthians chapter 5, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, here we go. Expel the immoral brother. It is actually reported that there is a sexual, there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even among pagans. A man has his father's wife and you are proud. Shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? Even though I am not physically present, I am with you in spirit and I have already passed judgment on the one who did this. I just as just as if I were present. When you are assembled in the name of our Lord Jesus and I am with you in spirit and the power of our Lord Jesus is present, 
Hand this man over to Satan so that the sinful nature may be destroyed and his spirit saved on the day of the Lord. Your boasting is not good. Don't you know that a little yeast works through the whole batch of dough? Get rid of the old yeast that you may be a new batch without yeast, as you really are. For Christ, our Passover lamb, has been sacrificed. Therefore, let us keep the festival, not with the old yeast, the yeast of malice and wickedness, but with bread without yeast, the bread of sincerity and truth. I have written you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people, not at all, meaning the people of this world who are immoral or the greedy and swindlers or idolaters. In that case, you would have to leave this world. But now I am writing you that you must not associate with anyone who calls himself a brother, but is sexually immoral, sexually immoral or greedy, an idolater or a slanderer or a drunkard, a drunkard or a swindler. With such a man, do not even eat. What business is it of mine to judge those outside the church? Are you not to judge those inside? God will judge those outside. Expel the wicked man from among you. All right, so that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 reading, okay? So it's pretty brief as we uh, review it. Uh, Paul's just going in more about how there's sexual immor immorality among the church, okay? And he's saying that, it's even, that even the pagans don't even do what y'all doing. And he was going into detail about uh, incest and how people are bragging about it and boasting about it. And that's not something to be proud of, um, basically. And he's just saying, like, hey, I'm going to judge y'all. Even, even if I'm not there physically, I'm going to judge y'all there as if I was there in y'all face. When I write these letters to y'all and preach to y'all, I'm going to correct y'all and reproof, reproof and rebuke y'all just as if I was there. Okay, so Paul was very uh, strong on holiness and being clean within the assembly and church, okay? And he's also just talking about um, sinful nature and the day of the Lord, things of that nature. He's saying how boasting is not good. And he says that even a little yeast, it works throughout the whole batch of dough. And he's saying like, yo, get rid of the old yeast so that a new batch without yeast, that's what you really are, basically. All right. He's basically saying like, make sure you have no malice or wickedness within you. All right. Make sure you have sincerity and truth inside of you. Okay. And Paul is just expressing to not associate with people who are sexually immoral and, and those of the world who are immoral and greedy and swindlers and idolaters. And the thing is, this, it's important about that because, like, when you hang out with certain people like that, it could rub off on you. Like, a person's sins or a person's secret sins or a person's lifestyle, it could trickle upon you and subconsciously or unconsciously, you know, in different ways. Like, um, that's why the book of Proverbs is, 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 talks about the righteous choose their friends carefully. And in the book of Proverbs, it talks about a person who hangs with a, a bunch of fools. It makes a companion of fools, you know. And you have to be selective about who you associate with, who you're around, um, and things of that nature, all right? Because, uh, you know, sin is contagious. Our sin, sinful influences, peer pressure, all those things are contagious. And people get, um, they, people entertain those sins daily just by their association with people. So that's why Paul's really going in about that. And, of course, like the sexual immoral, the greedy, the idolater, the slanderer, the drunkard, the swindler, all of that, you know? Because he's saying, like, yo, if y'all going to keep this church holy and clean, we got to really be on point about it. You know, we can't just be doing these things and proclaiming the things of God, you know, because we kind of contradict each other uh, and be a hypocrite when we do stuff like that. Okay, so we have to be more better. Um, me, you, all of us, we have to work better in those areas of our lives, okay? And then, you know, you're saying how God will judge those outside, expel the, the wicked man from among you. Okay, so Paul is really uh, brief about that, all right? So that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 5 reading. Now, let us go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All right. Chapter 6, here we go. Lawsuits among believers. If any, if any of you had a dispute with another, bear he take it before the ungodly for judgment instead of bear it before the saints. Do you know, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if you are to judge the world, are you not competent to judge trivial cases, trivial cases? Do you not know that we will judge angels? How much more the things of this life? Therefore, if you have disputes about such matters, appoint as judges even men of little accounts in the church. I say this to shame you. Is it possible that there is nobody among you wise enough to judge a dispute between believers? But instead, one brother goes to law against another. And this is this in front of unbelievers. 
The very fact that you have lawsuits among you means that you have been completely defeated already. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves cheat and do wrong and you do to the and you do this to your brothers. Do you not know that the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual, nor, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanders, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Sexual immorality. Hmm. Everything is permissible for me, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible for me, but I will not be mastered by anything. Food for the stomach and the stomach for food, but God will destroy them both. The body is not meant for sexual immorality, but for the Lord and the Lord for the body. By his power, God raised the Lord from the dead, and he will also, and he will also, he will raise us also. Do you not know that your bodies are members of Christ himself? Shall I then take the members of Christ and unite them with a prostitute? Never. Do you not know that he who unites himself with a prostitute is one with her in her body? For it is said, the two will become one flesh, but he who unites himself with the Lord is one with him in spirit. Flee from sexual immorality. All other sins a man commits are outside his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You were brought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. Hmm. The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Some heavy one right there, okay? So as we review the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, Paul is going more further to detail about lawsuits among believers and things of that nature. And as we go further into reviewing it, he's just discussing how if anyone has disputes with one another, how dare he take it to the before the ungodly for judgment instead of before the saints. And he said that, do you not know that the saints will even judge the world? And, um, and that's interesting. And that he also says that, do you not know that we will judge angels? You know, it's interesting he brought that up because Jesus even told the disciples about eternal life in a hundredfold. And he told the disciples how they would judge the 12 tribes of Israel as well. So that's a very interesting thing when it comes to judging the world, judging the 12 tribes, judging angels. That's a very powerful, like supernatural, prophetic thing. So that's something we have to kind of look more into. Probably because there's just such few scriptures on it, but also we could do a lot more probably research on it and dig more wisdom about that as well. Because that's a very interesting thing that does get often talked about enough. So as we go further into First Corinthians chapter 6, um, he's just saying that, you know, people are mistreating one another amongst other believers and that people are doing it against their own brothers and in front of unbelievers. OK, so the examples that are being set through lawsuits and wrong offenses, it's not good for the church. Basically, that's what he's getting at. He's basically summing up how um, you guys are not setting good examples among people who are trying to persuade to follow the Lord. Because if we're having discord and lawsuits and disputes and all type of stuff in the house of God, in the body of Christ, as one, as a unit, in front of the people we're trying to persuade to follow God, then people, it's going to make people stray away and not want to follow it neither. So that's basically what Paul's trying to get at when he was addressing the church and our conduct, our behavior. You know, what Paul's preaching and doctrine is, it's, it's, it's mostly like behavior. It's behavior, habits, treatment of each other. It, that's really what Paul goes in about, basically. All right, and then he goes further into detail about um, how the wicked will not inherit the kingdom of God. He says, do not, do, do not be deceived. He says, neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor male prostitutes, nor homosexual offenders, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor slanderers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And he says, as, and that is what some of you were. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. So at one point of our lives, many of us have uh, dealt with these things or what have you. And until this day, people still kind of struggle with these sins or what have you. But in order to inherit the kingdom of God, we got to really be on point, be cleaned up, be better, and really stay away from these things. That's why the importance of repentance, baptism, deliverance, um, a change of habits, a change of lifestyle, and everything matters, man. It's a real fight and struggle. You know, it's a real battle, really, because, um, 
you know, when you when people are escaping their old ways of life, some people have a challenge of a, a everyday battle of their old life trying to creep back in, you know. So some people have their ways when it comes to like backsliding or secret sins or um, what have you. Everybody, all of us have struggled in these areas and probably still some of us struggle to this day with it, right? So that's why we have to do better every day and um, we need to fast and pray more often. We need to pray more, fellowship more, keep ourselves more productive and busy throughout the day because the more busy, productive you are throughout the day, um, the less sin you could get caught up in. Um, most sin comes from idleness, and when you have too much time on your hands, you get what I'm saying? So that's why it's important to always keep yourself doing something um, good or like going to the gym or just um, doing something active for a person or a community, something that way you don't get caught up in sin so much, you know? So um, Paul's just going more into detail about the type of people that don't enter, that don't inherit the kingdom of God. All right, because Paul was really preaching about being clean, holiness, cleansing your temple, your, your, your temple being honorable before God, um, things of that nature. All right, and um, remember, if 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 the scriptures does talks about going to heaven and being into different bodies, um, we have to clean ourselves up with our choices and our lifestyles before we can enter that phase. Okay, that's why it's important to. Um, not die in your sins and not carry those things with you on the on the afterlife. All right, because everybody's going to face their judgment and give according to um, what how they live their lives. So we're all going to be held to count. Okay, all of us. Okay, so as we review First Corinthians chapter six, uh, Paul goes more into detail about sexual morality um, and how one two become one flesh and things of that nature from a physical sexual standpoint. And he's just basically saying like. You know, that the body was made for the Lord and the Lord for the body. He's also saying, like, when when someone unites himself with the Lord, he is one with him in the spirit. All right. He just keeps telling us to flee from sexual morality. And he goes into detail saying about how all other sins a man commits outside his body. But he who sins sexually sins against his own body. And he says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God? You are not your own. You are brought at a price. Therefore, honor God with your body. So all the people that keep saying, it's my body, it's my choice, this, this, and that. See, yes, you, can't, you can't have that mindset because Paul tells us our body belongs to God. Our body's not ours. We have to honor the most high way to God, keep our temples clean. Um, of course, with just our food, diet, habits, and the choices, but just you know, sexually. Because when a person does like masturbation, adultery, um, oral sex, unnatural sex, threesomes, uh, sodomy, anal, homosexuality, all that sexual perversions, all that debauchery, all those sexual deviancies, it goes against your own body. It's very self-afflicting. You get what I'm saying? So that's what Paul is really getting at because there's so much things that falls under sexual morality because when you go to the Old uh, Old Testament, the Lost Commandments, God gave us Lost His Commandments about marriage, sex, Marshall's, you know, Marshall stats, things like that. He gave us, he gave us all of it. You know, do not commit adultery. Um, you know, bestiality. You when you have, you know, people who do bestiality, people who are into homosexuality, all the LGBT stuff, uh, strange flesh, um, all the they them. You know, all this confusion. You see, it, it, the Lord is not the author of confusion. You get what I'm saying? And as you can see in America, where we at right now in the world, it's an attack on children. It's an attack on sexuality. It's an attack on women and their feminine. There's an attack on men and their masculinity. So there's a, it's like Satan is attacking people like sexually because what people don't understand, um, most demons and spirits are actually sexual. They're, they're mostly uh, sexual, you know? So that's why Paul is very stressing this thing very hard. All right. And really um, talking about the Holy Spirit and the temple and things of that nature, because that spiritual warfare uh, with sex is a very um, serious thing. Because you got to remember, like, uh, sex is holy. Like, God gave us it to, you know, be fruitful and multiply and honor him with marriage and the right way about it. And he gave us lost edge commandments to not stray away from it and to not cause confusion and unnatural stuff. So when people stray away from it and just do them and do their own stuff and have their own passions and lust and what have you, people get really, um, people hurt themselves in that. You know what I'm saying? Like, people who have careless sex or just do it with anybody, it causes a lot of different types of health problems down the long run. You know what I mean? So 
the self-control is very important. And, you know, even Jesus talked about lust as well. And he said that even if you look at someone um, from a lustful standpoint, that's even adultery, too, because you didn't do the physical act, but your mind and your heart did it. So Jesus was always pressing us about our mindset and our hearts, because that's what the most high judge the most is the hearts, you know. Because when your heart not in the right place, it, it sins on its own. You know, that's why Jesus was saying what comes out of a person's heart is what makes them clean and unclean. The heart, the intention, the attitude, that shows a person um, intentions of what they're about. So the word is really the, the, the powerful gospel and the, and, and the sound doctrine, man. It really refines us, man. That word really is a double-edged sword. It does cut deep. You know, it does cut deep, man. So we know better. We do better. We live better. Amen. So that sums up the book of First Corinthians chapter six reading. Okay, that sums up the book of First Corinthians chapter six reading. Okay, and um, I pray to God that anybody who's struggling with sexual morality, whether it is masturbation, lust, um, fornication, adultery, uh, you know, LGBT, whatever, like all that, like you can repent from that. You can't be delivered from it. You can't be set free from it. You can't get baptized. All right, the Lord offered that uh, for us, man. Any person who comes from any type of sinful lifestyle, what have you, um, we all can be saved, baptized, repent, come back to him, okay? Let us not die in no sins. Let us not die in any of our sins for that fact, okay? But um, that sexual morality, that got a real stronghold on a lot of people out here because we live in a very hypersexual society, over-sexualized world. So that's why these problems keep occurring. If it happened in ancient times during that time period, imagine now with all this internet and all this stuff. You dig what I'm saying? So, yeah, man, serious stuff. So the deliverance, baptism, repentance, man, let us go towards that. Amen. God loves you. OK, your sins are forgiven. Just turn from them and start following the Lord. OK. All right, y'all. So that was first Corinthians chapter six. Now let us go into first Corinthians chapter seven. OK. The book of first Corinthians chapter seven. Here we go. Marriage. Now, for the matters you wrote about. It is good for a man not to marry, but since there is so so much immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should fulfill his martial duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband. The wife's body does not belong to her alone, but also to her husband. In the same way, the husband's body does not belong to him alone, but also to his wife. Do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time so that you may devote yourselves to prayer. Then come together again so that Satan will not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. I say this as a concession, not as a command. I wish that all men were as I am, but each man has his own gift from God. One has this gift, another has that. Now, to the unmarried and the widows, I say, it is good for them to stay unmarried as I am. But if they cannot control themselves, they should marry. For it is better to marry than to burn with passion. To the married, I give this command, not I, but the Lord. A wife must not separate from a husband, but if she does, she must remain unmarried or else be reconciled to her husband, and a husband must not divorce his wife. To the rest, I say this, I, not the Lord. If any brother has a wife who is not a believer and she is willing to live with him, he must not divorce her. And if a woman has a husband who is not a believer and he is willing to live with her, she must not divorce him. For the unbelieving husband has been sanctified through his wife and the unbelieving wife has been sanctified through a believing husband. Otherwise, your children would be unclean. But as it is, they are holy. But if the unbeliever leaves, let him do so. If a believing, a believing man or woman is not bound in such circumstances, God has called us to live in peace. How do you know, wife, whether you will, you will save your husband? Or how do you know your husband will, whether you will save your wife? Nevertheless, each one should retain the place in life that the Lord assigned to him and to which God has called him. That is the rule I laid down in all the churches. Was a man already circumcised when he was called? He should not become uncircumcised. Was a man uncircumcised when he was called? He should not be circumcised. Circumcision is nothing and uncircumcision is nothing. Keeping God's commands is what counts. Each one should remain in the situation which he was in when God called him. Were you a slave when you were called? Don't let it trouble you. Although if you can gain your freedom, do so. 
For he who was a slave when he was called by the Lord is the Lord's freedman. Similarly, he who was a free man when he was called as, as Christ's slave. You were brought at a price. Do not become slaves of men. Hmm. Brothers, each man is as responsible to God should remain in the situation God called him to. Now about virgins, I have no command from the Lord, but I give a judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. Because of the present crisis, I think that it is good for you to remain as you are. Are you married? Do not seek a divorce. Are you unmarried? Do not look for a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned. And if a virgin marries, she has not sinned. But those who marry will face many troubles in this life. And I want to spare you this. What I mean, brothers, is, is that the time is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they had none. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if they were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For this world in its present form is passing away. I would like, to, I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs. How can he please the Lord? But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world, how he can please his wife, and his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord in both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world, how she, how she can please her husband. I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks he is acting improperly toward the virgin he is engaged to, and if she is getting along in years and he feels ought to marry, he should do as he wants. He is not sinning. They should get married. But the man who has settled the matter in his own mind, who is under no compulsion but has control over his own will, and who has made up his mind not to marry the virgin, this man also does the right thing. So then, he who marries the virgin does right, but he who does not marry her does even better a woman is bound to her husband as long as he lives but if her husband dies she is free to marry anyone she wishes but he must belong to the lord in my judgment she is happier if she stays as she is and i think that i too have the spirit of god okay so that's the book of first corinthians chapter seven reading okay and it just goes further into detail about paul's view of marriage all right and and this is a, I mean, chapter seven, first Corinthians chapter seven. It's a very interesting uh, read right here because Paul just goes further to detail about everybody's situation when it comes to marriage, how to go along with it, how to honor it and people's different backgrounds and situation, what have you. Now, mind you, Moses, Jesus, Paul, they all had different sayings and views about marriage in a certain way. But at the end of the day, it was all about honoring God, becoming one leaving your household, leaving your mother and your father um, to become one with your woman. And even said that to Abraham, what have you. But all in all, um, they were speaking these things in ancient times. Now, the thing about sound doctrine and gospel, the true word of God, is that, of course, God's word is forever and what have you. As we look at that time period, marriage was an issue even in that time period. That's why there's always so much questions about it, so much dialogues to have about it. We fast forward now to the world we're living in, where the divorce rate is sky high, and we are truly in a fallen society. The way men and women carry themselves today, there's no honor, respect in anything. There's no sacred stuff about anything going on. Um, when people already on their own behalf don't even honor God, people are definitely not going to honor his word or his life or his way of going about things. So if a person doesn't honor God, if a person doesn't honor themselves, they're definitely not going to honor a person who comes into their life. And this is like the case, right? This is why so much households are so damaged and broken. This is why so much marriages, relationships are so messed up. It's why there's so much resentment, unforgiveness, bitterness, um, domestic violence, cheating, adultery, uh, infidelity, all types of crazy stuff today because... Um, uh, this generation as a people us as a, as a whole we don't go back to the to the lord about things of this um topic you get me you get what i'm saying like most things people do don't honor god or his word most people do things out of flesh out of impulse out of just instincts you know what i'm saying 
And then what happens is when people rush marriage or people rush having children or people just rush doing things or just run to the wrong people, that's how more trauma, pain, and shock happens. And it causes more conflicts and issues. It causes divided households. It causes broken households. It causes traumatized children. Um, plenty of children all throughout the earth had to grow up seeing dysfunctional people in their household, watching dysfunctional parents, watching arguments and fights all the time, probably had an alcoholic daddy or alcoholic mom or um, had parents who just had their ways or were kind of hard headed or what have you. you know, everybody comes from all walks of life and could attest to it. And most marriages or households people come from did not honor God. It did not honor the most highest word, his law, statute, commandments, or how the gospel approach of marriage neither, okay? And what happens now from that is basically, as we read this word, it's, it's of course, edification and correction and reproof on, it's important to read it, but then we, we look at today's world, it's a very interesting challenge to apply this to today's structure, because um, we're in this era of like feminism and the Jezebel spirit, the mother goddess spirit went into, and it, then like with America, right? Like, you know, marriage in America is just a scam. I'm going to be honest because like a guy could just marry any woman in America and then the woman could just get bored or just be like, I'm tired of it. And she could just divorce his ass. She could get alimony, spouse support. Like, you you know what I'm saying? Like, it's crazy uh, how much marriage doesn't benefit a man in, in a society. It doesn't benefit a man at all. Um, I, I just think the way things are today, how things aren't honored the most high or anything, is it's, it's kind of like, man, you know, it, it's kind of a disadvantage for a man to get married because you you have more to lose than she does. You get what I'm saying? Like, um, I don't know, man. I just think it's crazy what people put each other through. Because in life, there's all types of husbands, all types of wives. There's all types of spouses and partners out there. And when you read this doctrine in First Corinthians chapter 7, and you also read what Jesus said about marriage and divorce and what Moses said about marriage and divorce, it's very challenging to apply that to today's world. Because um, obviously, of course, we're not in ancient times, but also because of, uh, you know, just looking at society as a whole. We're in perilous times. Okay, we're in perilous times, you know. And when you read the book of Proverbs, it also talks about how an excellent wife is a crown of a husband. And, of course, the Proverbs 31, uh, you know, every woman loves to quote that. We all love you know, love Proverbs 31. But we have to ask ourselves, like, is there truly a Proverbs 31 woman out here? Like, <laughs> we're in this, like, whore culture. We're in this Jezebel culture. So, um we're in the era where women will date a violent, toxic man or a very abusive man before they marry a good man or a decent guy, and vice versa. A guy will rather go out and get her, get him an easy woman or a whore than to get a decent woman with some value and morals. You know, so things are very weird and backwards. So that's what caused this discussion and dialogue of marriage as it is. You get what I'm saying? Um, I just think it's a challenging thing for people to find love in this era because Jesus did say that the love of many will grow cold, so people's hearts will wax cold, okay? The mistreatment of one another, the, ch- the shock, the trauma, um, the disrespect, the lack of honor in one another, the lack of respect, it leads to all this division, strife, and hate. And it gives this thing of people who are like, oh, I'm never going to get married, or, oh, I don't trust nobody. Do they see that? And that's the problem. Y- you know, uh, marriage is a beautiful thing. Don't ever let nobody tell you otherwise. Marriage is beautiful. Um, two people becoming one is beautiful. A union before God is beautiful. When it's a genuine man, a genuine woman together, God loves that. Um, but when we look at today's world, um, <laughs> people, martial statuses are what they are, man. Yeah, and, and the dating market is so damaged and messed up today. It's just like, wow, you know, it's very hard for people to find what they can. You know, because of traditional values and the word of God and how people live their lives, you factor all those things in together. Um, nobody's really trying to do it God's way at the end of the day. My thing is, man, um, let the Lord's will be done for you when it comes to your martial status. If God wants you to get married to this person, let it be. You honor that. You respect that person you're with. And you go all the way with that person. Y'all work it out in the end times, okay? Because... Um, I, I feel like, and, and this is just a, just a random view for me, but I feel like in these end times, God is going to, we're, we're, if anybody who's listening to this, if you're already married, you got a blessed union, God bless you and, and embrace that all the way to the, to the end. Um, but if anybody out there who's not married, right? Like for me, I'm single with no children, right? 
So a person like me or regardless of your situation, is some of you all may be widowed. Some of you may be divorced or single too or a single parent. I don't know your, your guys' situation, but what I do know is that I feel like in these end times with the direction this world is going, I feel like if God does bring a person in our life, it won't be out of our own will. It won't be out of our own preferences or leaning on our own understanding. It's going to be, I think, out of God's will and situation. I think as this world gets more evil and dark, um, God might just give you someone randomly to go survive the end times with. I feel like that's going to happen because I don't believe that God is going to leave us all lonely like this. Just saying, I think martial status wise, I feel like God is going to provide that comfort for you. And it necessarily don't always got to be a husband or a wife. It could always, it could be a friend. It could be, uh, you know, it could be, um, it could be just anybody along the way. I think, like, you know, and I watch a lot of like sci-fi movies, a lot of apocalypse movies, a lot of underworld movies, and you always kind of see those random things where random strangers just just get together, survive with one another. I think that's how it's going to be, honestly, because all of this like dating market stuff, all this preference, this dating app, social media, I, I don't think um, that's the best way to meet people anymore nowadays because I think things are just too out of control, honestly, and things are just too temporary. I think when, when God really puts someone in your life, it's going to be more out of a need than a want. It's not going to be out of lust. It's going to be out of love and support and situation. And when I say situation, I don't just mean it from a convenience or a temporary thing. I think it's like a for rest of your life type of thing. So I feel like as we, as more prophecy becomes more fulfilled and all of God's anger, wrath, and judgment gets poured out on this earth, um, God will provide some comfort for us. He's going to provide a cushion for us. Because the Lord always looks out and provides. And it's his timing, his will when it comes to everything in your life. So do not worry about your martial status. Do not worry about what's going to happen, how it's going to be. Am I going to be all by myself? How do I? Don't worry about that. The Lord's, the Lord got it all. He, the Lord got it, okay? In the meanwhile, you make sure your relationship with the Lord is on point and that you and the Lord are on great terms, okay? You make sure of that. Before you even get with anybody or even meet someone or what have you, you make sure... You, you and the most high are on point and together because at the end of the day, whether you were married, single, divorced, widowed, uh, lonely, whatever, your relationship with the Lord is the most important thing ever at the end of the day. And you can't put no relationship with no one else above that. Amen. We serve a, 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 a mighty God who is jealous. Okay. So he doesn't want anything, anything, anybody coming before us. You know, Jesus said anybody who loves their family or anybody above me is not worthy of the kingdom. So, Period, okay? Now, if the Lord does provide someone for you, cool. And let that person respect your views and beliefs as well and and what have you, all right? Y'all always work it out, be mature about everything and be solution-oriented, okay? So I know I kind of went on a lot about, about 1 Corinthians chapter 7, but as I was reading this doctrine that Paul was just going about with marriage, and I think back about what Jesus was saying about marriage and divorce and what Moses read, said about marriage and divorce, is just kind of like, I understand what all three of them are getting at with it, but then I look at today's world and I'm like, that's a very big challenge to apply that in today's era, just my opinion. I think with so much people with all types of traumas and walks of life, meeting one another and just popping each other's lives, it causes a lot of problems, honestly. Um, communication, listening, support, respect, love, those things are kind of falling on the wayside. So if you're still able to find a good person in this time that we're in, that's a blessing from above. It truly is. Because good people are rare, man. Good people are rare. Uh, so if you're a man and you're looking for a good woman, it's very rare and hard. Because a lot of women out here are on this like whore route, this I hate men route, this feminist route. They're on that route. And social media is destroying them badly. And this music culture is destroying them badly, too. And this pop culture influence is hurting them very badly. And um, ladies, if you're a woman out there looking for a man... Um, that can be a challenge too because a lot of guys are kind of like straying to the wayside. A lot of guys don't believe in God. A lot of men can be uh, beyond very prideful or nonchalant or, you, you know, even, hey, even dang near abusive, domestic violence, all that too. I mean, both can be like that. Men and women could be both violent and toxic, whatever, verbally abusive. So it's it's, it's a challenge, okay? So all in all, Regardless of what your martial status is, you make sure your relationship with the Lord is on point and you keep making the Lord happy. You keep obeying him. You keep being obedient. You keep pleasing him with your faith and your lifestyle and your actions. You keep being helpful to people along your life. And then the Lord reward you and bless you with a person. Enjoy it too. Okay? Enjoy it. So 
That's my view on marriage, dating, what Moses said about it, what Jesus said about it, what Paul said about it. <laughs> okay, I, I feel like all three of them had different kind of views about it. But yeah, man, all in all, man, let us, uh, let our relationship with the Lord be the best that we can have. Amen. Straight up. You make sure you and Jesus are on point, right? Yes, yes, y'all. So that is First Corinthians chapter 7, okay? Now let us go into the book of First Corinthians chapter 8, all right? First Corinthians chapter 8, here we go. All right, food sacrifice to idols. Now about food sacrifice to idols, we know that we all possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. The man who thinks he knows something does not yet know as he ought to know. But the man who loves God is known by God. So then about eating food sacrificed to idols. We know that an idol is nothing at all in the world and that there is no God but one. For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, as indeed there are many gods and many lords, yet for us there is but one God, the Father, from whom all things came and for whom we live. And there is but one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom all things came and through whom we live. But not everyone knows this. Some people are still accustomed to idols that when they eat such food, they think of it as as having been sacrificed to an idol. And since their conscience is weak, it is defiled. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do eat and no better if we do. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. For if anyone with a weak conscience sees you who have this knowledge eating in an idol's temple, won't he be emboldened to eat what has been sacrificed to idols? So this weak brother for whom Christ died is destroyed by your knowledge. When you sin against your brothers in this way and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if what I eat causes my brother to fall into sin, I will never eat meat again so that I will not cause him to fall. All right. Interesting read. So that's the book of First Corinthians chapter 8 reading. So Paul's just going further into detail about food sacrifice to idols and how people deal with eating and different gods, what have you. Because obviously in ancient times in that time period, um, people of different nations and walks of life, they used to sacrifice their foods to gods. Like King Nebuchadnezzar, he used to do that a lot. That's why Daniel made a, uh, a petition to not uh, go through with that and just to eat water, vegetables and fruits because... And, because um, Daniel didn't want to eat food that was sacrificed to other gods and be defiled with it. All right. So um, that's basically what Paul's trying to get at. Basically, he's basically saying like, hey, food ain't bad. Um, what have you. But if you are eating food in an idol's temple, it's going to make another brother sin. And if someone sees you and it's going to make some and you sin against Christ when you do that, basically. OK, so um, just got to be more watchful and careful of what we eat and pray before we eat, what have you, where we're eating at. You know, that's Paul basically just stressing about that, okay? So uh, that is the book of First Corinthians chapter 8 reading, okay? Now, let us go into the book of First Corinthians chapter 9, all right? First Corinthians chapter 9, here we go. The rights of an apostle. Am I not free? Am I not an apostle? Have I not seen Jesus our Lord? Are you not the result of my work in the Lord? Even though I may not be an apostle to others, surely I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. This is my defense to those who sit in judgment on me. Don't we have the right to food and drink? Don't we have the right to take a believing wife along with us, as do the other apostles and the Lord's brothers and Cephas? Or is it only I and Barnabas who must work for a living? Who serves as a soldier at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its grapes? Who tends a flock and does not drink of the milk? Do I say this merely from a human point of view? Doesn't the law say the same thing? For it is written in the law of Moses, do not muzzle an ox while it is treading out the grain. Is it about oxen that God is concerned? Surely he says this for us, doesn't he? Yes, this was written for us because when the plowman plows and the thresher threshes, they ought to do so in the hope of sharing in the harvest. If we have sown spiritual seed among you, is it too much if we reap a material harvest from you? If others have this right of support from you, shouldn't we have it all the more? But we did not use this right. On the contrary, we put up with anything rather than hinder the gospel of Christ. Don't you know that those who work in the temple get their food from the temple and those who serve at the altar share in what is offered on the altar? In the same way, the Lord has commanded that those who preach the gospel should receive their living from the gospel. 
but I have not used any of these rights, and I am not writing this in the hope that you will do such things for me. I would rather die than have anyone deprive me of this boast. Yet when I preach the gospel, I cannot boast, for I am compelled to preach. Woe to me if I do not preach the gospel. If I preach voluntarily, I have a reward. If not voluntarily, I am simply discharging the trust committed to me. What then is my reward? Just this, that in preaching the gospel, I may offer it free of charge and so not make use of any, uh, and so not make use of my rights in preaching it. Though I am free and belong to no man, I make myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law. So as to win those under the law, to those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but am under Christ's law. So as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak to win the weak. I have become all things to all men so that by all possible means, I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel that I may share in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race, all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training, for they do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beating the air. No, I beat my body and make it a slave so that after I have preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. All right. So that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9 reading. It's a very interesting read. Paul just goes further into detail about the rights of an apostle. And when it comes to doing the works of God, the living that comes with it or rewards or how to go about the living condition aspect as well. And any personal intentions are gained from it, right? And Paul is just saying from his part that, um, you know, when it comes to spreading the gospel, he's not really just trying to do it for a gain. He's just doing it for the Lord. And um, in order for him to reach out to a certain people, he had to become some like those people in order to kind of reach them. He basically saying like he had to stoop down to a person's level just so he could reach them. Because if he was if he was being a fisher of men, um, you have to relate to people in their situation. You can't just walk up to people all holier than thou and uppity because you can't win a soul like that. Because then you kind of appear as a dictator and then you don't really want a soul. So you have to kind of steep down to them, kind of get with them, hang out with them in a sense of, um, you know, like if you go to the hood and you spread the gospel in the hood, you got to kind of know the vibes that you got to read the room. You can't just go in there all up the on them because then they're not going to really want to hear what you have to say. Or if you go to the suburbs, you can't go in there all rough around the edges. You got to kind of, you know. Be a little bougie a little bit. You see what I'm saying? So Paul is basically saying like he had to adapt to the room in the sense of, okay, well, these how these people are. Let me try to just be like them so I can win them over. Because, of course, obviously throughout the Bible, it talks about not conforming to the ways of the world and not to fall after other patterns. But um, the book of Proverbs does says that he who wins who, he who wins a soul is wise. Okay, so in order to win a soul, you have to know how to reach them right where they're at. You can't just be so... Uh, extra religious all the time you'll never you'll never win a soul being religious you'll never it never happens that way okay you have to be able to understand people have patience with people be understanding of them in their environment and respect it nonetheless okay so that's basically what paul is trying to get at through that okay and paul also talked about you know running the race you know fighting a good fight of faith running the race and that make sure you, you're running with a purpose and that the prize you're going after is, is eternal all right, because when people go after things in life, their ambition is on worldly things that are temporary, that don't last. But Paul's racist fight is saying like, hey, you know, we're going to go after eternal glory, you know, eternal life, a hundredfold church in heaven. That's basically what Paul was getting at, you know. So that's how we got to live our lives. We have to live our lives with a heavenly mindset, with a heavenly approach and let everything be eternal about what we go about things. When we're spreading the gospel, we're doing this for heaven. We're doing this for the kingdom of heaven. We're doing it for the most high. You know what I mean? Kingdom business, Father's business, Father's will. Amen. So that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 9 reading. Okay. Now let us go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. All right. Book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10. Here we go. All right. Warnings from Israel's history. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. For I do not want you to be ignorant of the fact, brothers, that our forefathers were all under the cloud and they and that they all passed through the sea. 
They were all baptized in Moses in the cloud and in the sea. They all ate the same spiritual food and drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank from the same from the spiritual rock that accompanied them, and that rock was Christ. Nevertheless, God was not pleased with most of them. Their bodies were scattered over the desert. Now, these things occurred as examples to keep us from setting our hearts on evil things as they did. Hmm. Do not be idolaters as some of them were, as it was written. As it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and got up to indulge in pagan revelry. Revelry. We should not commit sexual immorality as some of them did. And in one day, 23,000 of them died. We should not test the Lord as some of them did and were killed by snakes. And do not grumble as some of them did and were killed by the destroying angel. These things happened to them as examples and were written down as warnings for us on whom the fulfillment of the ages has come. So if you think you are standing firm, be careful that you don't fall. No temptation has seized you. You accept what is common to man and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear. But when you are tempted, he will also provide a way out so that you can stand up under it. Mm hmm. Idle feast and the Lord's Supper. Therefore, my dear friends, flee from idolatry. I speak to sensible people. Judge for yourselves what I say. Is not the cup of thanksgiving for which we give thanks a participation in the blood of Christ? And is not the bread that we break a participation in the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf. We who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one loaf. Consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifice participate in the altar? Do I mean then that a sacrifice offered to an idol is anything or that an idol is anything? No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not to God. Hmm. And I do not want you to be participants with demons. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons too. You cannot have part in both the Lord's table and the table of demons. Are we trying to arouse the Lord's jealousy? Are we stronger than he? Hmm. The believer's freedom. Everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial. Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. Nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. Eat anything sold in the meat market without raising questions of conscience, for the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. If some unbeliever invites you to a meal and you want to go, eat whatever is put before you without raising questions of conscience. But if anyone says to you this has been offered in sacrifice, then do not eat it, both for the sake of the man who told you and for conscience sake. The other's man's conscience, I mean not yours, for why should my freedom be judged by another man's conscience? Hmm. If I take part in the meal with thankfulness, why am I denounced because of something I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Do not cause anyone to stumble, whether Jews, Greeks, or the church of God, even as I try to please everybody in, my, in every way. For I am not seeking my own good, but the good of many, so that they may be saved. All right, y'all. So that's the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 reading, okay? Book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10 reading. So as we review the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul just goes into detail about warning about the history of Israel, how with the Israelites, they were able to encounter all the powerful encounters with Moses and God and all different things. But um, many of them, uh, God was not pleased with. You get what I'm saying? And examples where they, their hearts were set on evil things. They were idolaters and, you know, they were caught up in sexual morality as well and how the Lord killed some of them and how the Lord got rid of them by snakes as well. He you know, like God killed Aaron's sons too, right in front of him. So that, that shows you to not follow the examples that the former Israelites did, all right? Because um, the former Israel, they were doing a lot of rebellious, wicked things. So that's why you shouldn't be braggadocious about just being an Israelite all the time like that, because they were doing a lot of wild stuff. So we have to be God-fearing people. We have to respect the Most High in His Word and how um, we treat each other as well. That's what Paul is basically just getting at, all right? And to not fall in that way, but to, you know, stay faithful to the Lord, and then Paul also goes into further detail about temptations and what have you and how how the Lord, he will provide an escape for us to get away from temptation. OK, so many people do with temptations, you know, different ways of situations. But um, you having that self-control, you have you trust in the Lord, uh, the Lord, the Lord got you. He'll 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 interrupt you. He'll intervene in a way to get you out of that temptation he's about to get into. 
through a phone call or a notification or a random intervention. God has a way of escaping, uh, providing an escape for us to not fall under temptation, okay? So we have to defeat temptation, defeat lust, defeat um, all those everyday battles, okay? We have to stop um, being so caught up in our own lust and passions, okay? And being caught up in wrongdoings, okay? That's what Paul is basically getting at because, you know, God is faithful. So, you know, he will look out for you. He will always find a way for you to not get caught up in that, okay? And as we go further into 1 Corinthians chapter 10, Paul just goes more further to detail about idol feast and the Lord's Supper and things of that nature and to flee from idolatry and, you know, speak to sensible people and just be watchful of your environment, how you're going about things when you're eating with people, where you're going, invitations, um, eating clean foods, unclean foods or uh, what have you, being careful about it. Like if you're in a place where there's no sacrificed food or whatever, enjoy yourself, have a good time. But food has been sacrificed. Flee from it, get away from it. All right, that's what Paul's basically getting at when he was going in about that, okay? And also, uh, Paul goes more further to detail about the believer's freedom, you know? And he's just also saying how, um, to, to sum it up, he's saying like everything is permissible, but not everything is beneficial, Everything is permissible, but not everything is constructive. So um, nobody should seek his own good, but the good of others. So Paul is just telling us to not be such a narrow, uh, uh, not to be narrow minded, not to be a narcissist and to stop seeking selfish ambitions and always looking out for ourselves. We got to be mindful of others, too, and to care for others regards as well. OK, and having a good conscience about things and what have you. And all in all, Paul is just saying, like, hey, you know. Whether you eat or drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God and do not cause anyone to stumble, whether it's a Jew, a Greek or someone from the church of God. Um, you know, just try to like stay out the way when it comes to that. You know what I'm saying? For he's saying, even as I try to please everybody in every way, for I am not seeking my own good, but the good of others and many so that they may be saved. All right. So Paul's just basically saying, have a regard for others around you, yourself. And in commentary scripture within the book of First Corinthians chapter 10 is titled, God is Faithful. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has seized you except what is common to man, and God is faithful. He will not let you be tempted beyond what you can bear, but when you are tempted, he will also provide a way so that you can stand up under it. Amen. God is faithful, y'all. It definitely is. Amen. So that is First Corinthians chapter 10, okay? Now, let us get into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 11, here we go. Follow my example as I follow the example of Christ. Propriety in worship. I praise you for remembering me in everything and for holding to the teachings just as I pass them on to you. Now, I want you to realize that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of the woman is man, and the head of Christ is God. Every man who prays or prophesies with his head covered dishonors his head. And every woman who prays or prophesies with her head uncovered dishonors her head. It is just as though her head were shaved. If a woman does not cover her head, she should have her hair cut off. And if it is a disgrace for a woman to have her hair cut or shaved off, she should cover her head. A man ought to not cover his head since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of man. For man did not come from woman, but woman came from man. Neither was man created for woman, but woman for man. For this reason, and because of the angels, the woman ought to have a sign of authority on her head. In the Lord, however, woman is not independent of man, nor is man independent of woman. For as woman came from man, so also man is born of woman. But everything comes from God. Judge for yourselves, is it proper for a woman to pray to God with her head uncovered? Does not the very nature of things teach you that if a man has long hair, it is a disgrace to him? But that if a woman has long hair, it is her glory. For long hair is given to her as a covering. If anyone wants to be contentious about this, we have no other practice, nor do the churches of God. The Lord's Supper. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more than do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. 
When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. For as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you for this? Certainly not. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whatever, whenever you drink, and whenever you drink, Whenever you drink it in remembrance of me, for whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you will, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and the blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. For anyone who eats and drinks without recognizing the body of the Lord and eats and drinks judgment of, of the Lord eats and drinks judgment on himself. That is why many among you are weak and sick, and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. When we are judged by the Lord, we are being disciplined so that we will not be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further directions. All right, so that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 reading. It just it just goes more further to detail about propriety in worship and how a man or woman should worship in the temple, dealing with their head coverings or their hairs or what have you, and not covering over their head while they're praying or prophesizing and things of that nature. And also, Paul goes more further to detail about the Lord's Supper as well, how to honor it and go about it and to not bring judgment upon yourselves and examine yourselves and things of that nature, okay? And how to eat with one another and how to deal with one another within the temple when it comes to worship as well, okay? So that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 11 reading. Before I go into 1 Corinthians chapter 12, I would like to read the commentary that's within 1 Corinthians chapter 11, okay? So here we go. Weekend. The welcomed warrior, Cornelius, the angel answered, your prayers and gifts to the poor have come up as a memorial offered, offering before God. Now send men to Joppa to bring back a man named Simon, who is called Peter. Book of Acts chapter 10, verses 4 through 5. All right. So the title of this commentary is Cornelius. Okay. The welcomed warrior Cornelius. Here we go. The anticipation was as bad as that in the hours before a battle. Cornelius sat on a stone bench for a moment, but then decided that the only appropriate posture for the occasion was kneeling. Oh God, he began, what message will this stranger bring to me? During the silence that followed his prayer, Cornelius recognized the familiar calm before, the com before a command. Centurions did not expect to be told to wait. They simply expected to wait. The veteran smiled, Lord, you have not yet asked me anything I would not expect from my superior. I will wait. In the shadows of the overhang surrounding the courtyard, family and friends also waited. Many had questions about Cornelius' faith, but all who had come to the courtyard were impressed by it. They wondered whether the God who seemed so real to him could ever be as real to them. Cornelius turned attentively toward a noise in the doorway. His trusted lieutenant pushed open the gate, and two of Cornelius' servants and a number of other men poured into the courtyard. The crowd in the shadow surged forward. Cornelius guessed correctly which of the strangers was Simon, called Peter, and felt compelled to bow out of respect for this man sent by God. To his surprise, he felt Peter's strong hands grasp him by the shoulders and guide him to an upright position. The eyes that met his own mirrored the awe he felt. God had brought them together. Cornelius turned to accompany Peter and his companions into the courtyard and realized that they were now facing a sizable crowd. Peter chuckled and murmured, I see you invited a few friends. I wanted as many people as possible to hear God's message firsthand. I hope that is agreeable to you, sir, Cornelius replied. Until two days ago, I might not have agreed with you, Cornelius, but God has changed my thinking, responded Peter. But let's start with you. Why did you send for me? Cornelius quickly described the angelic visit and the instructions he had received. He thanked Peter for coming. Peter took that as his cue 
and began to speak to the crowd. He described a seed of forgiveness that is planted in any person who believes in Jesus. The air in the courtyard seemed filled with more than the sound of a fisherman's Aramaic. The crowd responded with a chorus or praise to God. Peter laughed as his voice was drowned out. He shouted to his companions, if the Lord has baptized these with his spirit, how can we not add some water in Jesus' name to this power, to this wonderful moment? On that forgettable day, the gospel came in all its life-changing power for the first time to Gentiles in the city of Caesarea. Back to the future. How did God overturn Peter's prejudice against Gentiles as candidates for the gospel? Against what groups do you harbor prejudices? What criteria do you use to decide whether someone has genuinely become a Christian? Peter shared the gospel with those who had never heard it before. Do you know anyone who has never heard the good news? What opportunities do you have to share God's word with this person? The story continues. To learn more of Cornelius' story, read the book of Acts chapter 10, verses 1 through 11, and also 18. All right, so that is the commentary just based around Cornelius and his encounter with Peter the Gentiles and the Holy Spirit all in all as well, okay? So now, let us go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, okay? The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, here we go. Spiritual gifts. Now, about spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be ignorant. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I tell you that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but the same God works all of them in all men. Now to each one, the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one There is given through the Spirit the message of wisdom, to another the message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit, to another faith, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by that one Spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same Spirit. And he gives them to each one just as he determines. Hmm. One body, many parts. The body is a unit, though it is made up of many parts. And though all its parts are many, they form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jews or Greeks, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. Now the body is not made up of one part, but of many. If the foot should say, because I am not a hand, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, it would not for that reason cease to be part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would the sense of smell be? But in fact, God has arranged the parts in the body, every one of them, just as he wanted them to be. If they were all one part, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts but one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you, and the, eye and, the head, and the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. On the contrary, those parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable, and the parts that we think are less honorable we treat with special honor, and the parts that are unpresentable are treated with special modesty, while our pres- presentable parts need no special treatment, But God has combined the members of the body and has given great honor to the parts that lacked it, so that there should be no division in the body, but that its parts should have equal concern for each other. If one part suffers, every part suffers with it. If one part is honored, every part rejoices with it. Now you are the body of Christ, and each one of you is a part of it. And in the church of God, and and in the church, God has appointed first of all apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then workers of miracles, also those having gifts of healing those able to help others, those with gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kinds of tongues are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, do all work miracles, do all have gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but eagerly desire the greater gifts. All right, so that's the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12 reading right there. 
Very important, powerful read right there because as we review the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 12, it just goes more further to detail about spiritual gifts and concerning the body of Christ. And he's just saying how um, there's different kinds of gifts, but the same spirit, different kinds of service, but the same Lord, different kinds of workings, but the same God works all of them in all men. And basically he's just saying now everyone's gifted with different things, all right, and that we should all work together through it. Okay, let there be no division overall. Okay, and he talks about the spirit, the message of wisdom, the message of knowledge by means of the same spirit, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one spirit, to another miraculous powers, to another prophecy, to another distinguishing between spirits, to another speaking in different kinds of tongues, and to still another the interpretation of tongues. All these are the work of one and the same spirit, and he gives them each one just as he determines, okay? So he's just declaring how everybody's different gifts of speaking tongues or healing or uh, prophesying, things like that, okay? So everybody has different gifts, okay? The Lord made us differently in that own sense, but we're all serving the same God all and all together, amen? So you saw how the differences are from, from Noah, Elijah, Moses, Abraham, Job, Ezekiel, Daniel, you see how all of them are just so different, but all serving the same God. And that's just amazing and beautiful how creative, how God can be with his people and how much he can get one out of one person in a different way from the other. And I think that's just a very beautiful thing. Um, you know, that's very amazing. And you remember like when Jesus and the disciples were walking, the disciples, they always had arguments about who's the greatest to ever walk for God because they were kind of having this elitist mindset when it came to gifts and powers and rankings. But Jesus was saying that the, the kingdom wasn't built that way. You know, it's not like that. It's, you know, it all goes back to the law, such of commandments. It goes back to really loving God and serving him and doing right by people. That's how Jesus was basing it off of, not basing it off of powers and status and all that. But God gives people differently. Like you see how God, he gifted Joseph and Daniel with high position and interpreting dreams. You notice that. But then he gave Elijah the power to call fire from heaven. But then, and healing too. And Elijah was so righteous, he didn't even die. He went up to heaven, right? And then he also gave Joshua, you know, Joshua had the power over the moon and everything. So Joshua had that power as well from the Lord. And that it stood still, what have you. Then you see how God just deals with people differently. You know, and Elisha, he had a double portion of Elijah's because he requested and asked for it before he went up to heaven. So um, you, you you just see how God uses people differently, okay? And that's how we are too. Uh, my gifts may be different from yours. Your gifts may be different from mine, but we're all serving the same God, amen? We're still all on the same team. You know, like if you're watching sports, everybody can't be the quarterback. Somebody got to be a quarterback. Somebody got to be a running back. Somebody got to be a wide receiver. Somebody got to be an offensive tackle. Somebody got to block, you know? Somebody got to play defense. Somebody got to be the one who could tackle good or coverage good. Everybody, somebody got to be a punter, somebody got to be a kicker. So when you see a team in a carnal sense, every person has different gifts. That's just in a carnal physical matter, right? And even in a work environment, some people are a chef, some are the cashier, some are the dishwashers. Everybody plays a part. So Paul's just making that distinction from a spiritual sense that we all have different uh, things God gifted us with, okay? And we have to use them for God's glory, and not for any other reason, Okay. And to help others with our gifts as well, okay? And, um, yeah, man, it's very important. And Paul just also establishes um, the order of, like, the church, the order of the body of Christ and how it should be. The appointing of it at first apostles, then second prophets, then third teachers, then the workers of miracles, and then all those who have the gifts of healing, then all those who are able to help others, those who have the gifts of administration, and those speaking in different kind of tongues, you know, so that is the order and establishment right there of how the body of Christ is set up, okay? And then when you look at almost every individual in the Bible, every person basically kind of had that, you know, basically, you know, you're able to help others, you know? Like Samson was a warrior, Joshua was a warrior, David David was just super gifted. Like David was a poet, warrior, <laughs> he, he was a king, he was all that, you know what I mean? Um, but of course, all in all, Jesus is the, you know, he's all that. Jesus is the firstborn of all creation. He sits at the right hand of the Father. He's the Son of God. He died for our sins. He was the high priest. He was the king. I mean, the sacrificial lamb, the anointed one, the branch. Like, Jesus is all of that. That's what makes him so amazing. Amen. That's what makes him so, so powerful and lit. 
we, we serve some lit a lit creator awesome son amen like that's just so cool um, he's all that basically in one you know because jesus he's the high priest from the order of melchizedek and he's also a king of judah king of israel so he, he's he's all of that you know that's just powerful and he was able to heal and help others prophesize all of that man so everything paul said about speaking tongues healing helping others miracles jesus had all that just within himself alone that's what makes him so worthy and able amen that's what makes jesus the true anointed one hallelujah yes yes y'all so that is the book of first corinthians chapter 12 reading okay very awesome and also i just want to put note also where paul said um for we were all baptized by one spirit into one body, whether Jew or Greek, slave or free. And we were all given the one spirit to drink. All right. So no division, people. OK, no division, no envy, no jealousy, no step on each other's lanes, no copycat, no nothing. Stay in our lanes for each other. Serve the same creator. Do what we're called to do. Uplift one another. Support and encourage one another. Amen. Amen. So there you have it with First Corinthians chapter 12 reading. Now, let's go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, okay? The book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13, here we go. Love, and now I will show you the most excellent way. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am only a resounding going or a clanging symbol. Hmm. If I have the gift of prophecy and can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge and I have a faith that can move mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. <sighs> if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames, but have no love, I gain nothing. Love is patient. Love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It is not rude. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. Love does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. It always protects, always trusts, always hopes, always preserves, per perseveres. Love never fails. But where there are prophecies, they will cease. Where there are tongues, they will be stifled. They will be stilled. Where there is knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. But when perfection comes, the imperfect, the imperfect disappears. When I was a child, I talked like a child, I thought like a child, I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I put childish ways behind me. Mm -hmm. Now we see but a poor reflection as in a mirror. Then we shall see face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I f am fully known. And now these three remain, faith, hope, and love. But the greatest of these is love. Amen. Amen. That's powerful right there. Yes, yes, we touch and agree. So that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 reading. 13 reading is a very brief, shorter reading, but it's a very effective and powerful. It's very powerful. And, and 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we all love to quote that, you know, but we have to live by it. Amen. It's one thing to just quote something and what about it, but if we're not living by it, then, you know, got to have that love, people. Got to have that love, y'all. You know, there's people out there who can preach, prophesize, do all types of things, but they're cold, you know? That love is very important, man. God knows if we have love in our hearts or not. He knows the hearts. He judged the hearts, amen? So real love, not that just vain, over-the-top fake love. I mean, like, real, legit, spiritual love, real warmth, compassion, kind, kindness, tenderness towards everyone, too. When you truly love the Lord your God for all your mind, heart, soul, strength, and might, and you love your neighbors as you love yourselves, you shouldn't struggle issue with love at all. You shouldn't. You should not walk around with conditional love. You should not walk around nitpicking on how you should give out your love neither. Leave love is freely. There's no political correctness when it comes to love. Amen. And Paul just basically breaks that down within the 13th chapter of it, you know. A lot of and remember, Jesus did say that the love of many will grow cold. So many hearts will wax cold. The, the love of many will bound will grow cold. The love will it'll be gone. Basically, Jesus is saying like, "Yo, love is gonna be gone in this world." So you better not look for it in here. What basically is, you better keep that warm heart and make sure your heart don't get cold and unforgiving. And unforgiving, I have a heart of stone. And you also better make sure you're an example of love. You better make sure that you better show love to all types of people because people are watching you. All right. If people know you a messed up person, you foul, you green, all oh, you this and that. See, 
you're going to contradict yourself when you're not showing love. So we got to show love to all. We got to show love to the poor, the widow, the uh, orphan, the elder, everybody, man. Got to show love, man. If anybody needs love, man, it's, it's the children, man. There's a lot of neglected children out there, a lot of unloved children walking around. We got to show love to these children and have to remember that the kingdom of heaven does belong to such as these. That's what Jesus said. So when we're approaching a child, we got to love that child because maybe that child isn't getting proper love at home or probably or pro you never know if that child's getting bullied or whatever. You don't know what these children be going through, man. So you got to uh, be patient with them and have a lot of love towards them because a lot of them don't, probably don't know how to be loved well or what have you or give it. And even in our personal life, some some of us probably haven't been loved properly. That's probably why we struggle with giving out love. But And there's others who've been through a lot of hell, a lot of trauma, a lot of shock, a lot of pain, and they're able to still smile and show love and give and do generous things. In my view, I feel like people who've suffered the most and went through a lot in their life tend to be the most level people. Sometimes it's like that. Like you, you'll run into people like that. You'll you'll run into a person and be like, man, how this person always in a good mood? How this person always smiling? How they keep up so well? And they've been through this. It's like they just, that love of God is in them. That love of God is in them all the way. You know, when you love the Lord your God for all your mind, heart, soul, strength, that might you're not tripping off anything. You're not holding no grudges. You're not tripping on anybody. Yeah, you deal with stuff wrong people on the way, but you don't hold on to it. You know what I'm saying? And um, you're more mature about your runnings with people compared to a person who has conditional love who's nitpicky about how they want to go about it or what have you. You know what I'm saying? So very powerful ch uh, chapter right there, man. You know, there needs to be more love in the church, the house of God. There needs to be more love at home. There needs to be love in the neighborhoods. There needs to be love in the workplace. There needs to be love everywhere. But see, as we look today, love is lost almost everywhere. You know, love is almost extinct, basically. So we have to be the last examples of it. Like basically God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, and us as his people, we're the last examples of love on earth, basically. That's why we're going to deal with so much trials and tribulations. We're going to deal with so much persecutions and so much ridicules because um, this world, love is extinct in it. Remember, love was lost even in ancient times. You got to remember that. And Jesus was still showing love. He was still showing love, still had love to heal people, all types of stuff. He didn't withhold the power of God or service towards anybody. So if somebody want a prayer from us, you give, it to, you give them a prayer with no problem. Somebody want healing, they want a prayer, they want a message, they want something, give it to them. Freely, lovingly, openly, or merry heartedly, all of that. Because um, that's just how we got to be as people, okay? We can't be out here acting all religious and super spiritual and we ain't got no love in our hearts. So Paul really put us in check about that, and I love that, okay? It's very important, okay? So now, that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 reading. Now, let us go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. All right. The book of First Corinthians chapter 14. Here we go. Gifts of prophecy and tongues. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritually gift, spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies, who prophecies, speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be to you? What good will I be to you unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Hmm. Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound or a clear call, sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Mm -hmm. Undoubtedly, there are still there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If I then do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you since you are eager to have spiritual gifts. Try to excel in gifts that build up the church. For this reason, everyone who anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? 
I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one find himself among those who do not understand? Say amen to your thanksgiving since he does not know what you are saying. You may be giving thanks as well enough. You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others instruct others than ten thousand words in a tongue. Hmm. Brother, stop thinking like children in regard to evil be infants, but in your thinking be adults. Hmm. In the law it is written, through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign, not for believers, but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some who do not understand or some believers, unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everybody is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and will be judged by all. And the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. Hmm. Orderly worship. What then shall we say, brothers? When you come together, everyone has a hymn or a word of instruction, a revelation, a tongue or an interpretation. All of these must be done for the strengthening of the church. If anyone speaks in a tongue, two or at the most three should speak one at a time and someone must interpret. If there is no interpreter, the speaker should keep quiet in the church and speak to himself and God. Two or three prophets should speak, and the others should weigh carefully what is said. And if a revelation comes to someone who is sitting down, the first speaker should stop. For you can all prophesy in turn, so that everyone may be instructed and encouraged. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the control of prophets. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Mm -hmm. Or confusion, but of peace. As in all the congregations of the saints, women should remain silent in the churches. They are not all allowed to speak, but must be in submission, as the law says. If they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home, for it is disgraceful for women to speak in the church. Did the word of God originate you with you? Originate with you? Or are you the only people it has reached? If anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritually gifted, let him acknowledge that what I am writing to you is the Lord's command. If he ignores this, he himself will be ignored. Therefore, my brothers, to be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues. But everything should be done in a fitting and orderly way. Okay, so that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 reading. Okay, so as we review the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 14 reading, Paul just goes more further to detail about gifts and prophecy and uh, gifts of prophecy in tongues. All right. And what Paul is just basically ta- discussing is that when a person speaks in tongues, they're not speaking to men, but to God. And um, indeed, no one understands him except he murders, he utters mysteries with his spirit. And Paul is just making, the, uh, he's just evaluating when someone's speaking in tongues, when someone's speaking in prophecy. He's basically saying that if a person just speaks in tongues and there's no instruction and stuff behind it, then no one will understand it or get it. But if there's instruction and edification and reproof about it with the tongue speaking, then it holds more weight and what have you. Excuse me. And then also Paul also describes how people can also speak in tongues and they could not uh, mean much. You know, what I mean, it won't really be, be much effective, basically. And um, he also goes in about revelation or knowledge or word or instruction or prophecy. It, it does the person no good. What good will it be? You know? And let's see what we have here. He goes further and further about tongues and languages, basically, edification. And also, when we go further into it, he talks about being eager for spiritual gifts and try to excel in gifts that build up the church, basically. And let's see what we have here. I want to read this in commentary scripture that's titled, God is Peaceful. For God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. First Corinthians chapter 14, verse 33. Let's see. All right, all right. So, yeah, he's just going further about orderly worship as well with songs and hymns and interpretations and strengthening the church, all right? 
and an interpreter, okay? There needs to be an interpreter there to break down, explain everything to people who might not understand yet. You get what I'm saying? So it's important to consider others when you're going about speaking or prophesizing or what have you. And then further into 1 Corinthians chapter 14, Paul goes in with all the congregation of the saints and says that women should remain silent in the churches and they're not allowed to speak, but must be in submission as the law says. And if they want to inquire about something, they should ask their own husbands at home for it's disgraceful for women to speak in the church. Okay, so this scripture right here, it always ruffles a lot of feathers. This one is so-called controversial, gets a lot of people worked up. Uh, People debate and argue about this one a lot when Paul declares this, right? So you have to remember in ancient times, um, in that time period, of, of course, when you read the book of Ezekiel, God says that the leaders of flock are men obviously, and it still is to this day. And in here, Paul's just talking about um, dealing with a church, and he's basically saying, oh, a woman shouldn't speak, because in that time period, obviously, it was all based about the patriarchy and the leaders of flock being men, and as always a man of God, whether a high priest, a prophet, a king, or a, a servant, always having to say so, being led by a Lord, what have you. So it wasn't really common for women to say something. But Paul is just discussing it from his view, According to the law within that time period of that frame, we fast forward to today, to today, you see a lot more women that are pastors, evangelists, speakers, all that more than ever. Um, when you look at today, uh, m- not much men are truly interested in following God or being a leader of a flock or what have you. So more women are more in the forefront about this than men. So that's why almost a lot of churches, you see a lot more female pastors, a lot more women who are uh, preaching or what have you, All right? So um, there's many that plays into it. And some people even made YouTube videos about how matriarchy has destroyed the churches and the households and things of that nature and what have you. But overall, when you read Ezekiel, God says, my leaders are flock are men. And if a wo- if someone, man or a woman, if someone's appointed or equipped or anointed to do some, then let it be. Um, because women can prophesy. You know, the book of Joel says that. It says that the Lord will pour his spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters. So he's saying men and women will prophesy about me and speak in tongues and confess about me and what have you and have spiritual encounters. So um, you, that's why when it comes to the kingdom of heaven, the body of Christ, there can't be no spirit of division. There can't be no racism. It can't be no prejudice. It can't be no uh, sexism. It can't be that stuff because God uses both men and women for his glory. We're, made, we're all made in his image and likeness. If the Lord pours out his spirit upon a woman to do some, then let it be. If he pours out his spirit on his man to do some, then let it be as well. All right. So let us not be so hung up on differences and uh, what have you, because um, that spirit division, that's not something that should be uh, uh, within the body of Christ at all. All right. So. And remember, when Paul was going towards Spain, coming from Rome and everything, what have you, he, he had shot, he had hardworking women around him. Paul had women within his um, circles as well that he interacted with in the body of Christ working. So he's, he, he shouted out to the women and greeted them for those who were working hard for the Lord. So Paul didn't dismiss or disregard women when it came to that. He just said it within just this chapter and this verse alone. And a lot of people kind of get offended when they read that one. But... Um, all in all, let the Lord's will be done. Let the Lord use who he uses, okay? And that's that, all right? So, yeah, I would like to read, um, just re- repeat it one more time, that God is, fe- God is peaceful. God is not the author of confusion, but he is of, he is of peace, okay? Always keep that in mind, people, all right? So that is the way of that is and also at the end he says therefore my brothers be eager to prophesy and do not forbid speaking in tongues but everything should be done in decency and order let everything be done in decency and order okay all right so that wraps up the book of first corinthians chapter 14 okay now we will get into the book of well before we get into the book of first corinthians chapter 15 i would like to read this commentary within 14 13 as well okay so here we go Okay, today's Bible reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 1 through 13, recommended reading, book of Deuteronomy chapter 10, verses 12 through chapter 11 through verse 32, the book of Matthew chapter 22, verses 34 through 40, and also the book of Galatians chapter 5. 
the title of this commentary is It Never Fails. Odd, the things that make us feel like a failure, earning 30 grand instead of 60, becoming ill, getting an answer wrong, missing a grounder, even odder, the things that make us feel like a success, earning 60 grand, staying healthy, getting an answer right, throwing out the guy at first. Paul's well-known explanation of love shows just how mixed up our ideas of failure and success, and success can be. No matter what grand things we might accomplish, no matter what fine visions we might believe, no matter what deep and difficult truths we, may, we might learn, if we leave out love, it, it all means nothing. All of our imperfect accomplish, accomplishments will fail. One thing, however, will never fail of the realities that remain when all else is gone. Only one is supreme love there it is without love we fail with it we can't help but succeed does that sound too easy well people who've never tried it might think so but this love is different from the natural love we've experienced this kind of love combines virtues such as patience honesty forgiveness trust and good manners further it rules out self-interested motives this kind of love isn't easy at all in fact, only one man has ever completely accomplished it. He knows and stands ready to forgive every rotten act you've ever committed. He always tells you the truth, and while the words might hurt, he desires only to heal. He sets an impossible pace, but comes to your aid as, a, as you stumble along behind him. Despite the fact that you don't deserve such a sacrifice, he even gave his life for you. This kind of love doesn't represent an out-of-the-way tangent or minor application of our faith. It stands as the central characteristic of faith. Jesus takes it a step further when he commands, Love one another as I have loved you, so you must love one another. By this, all men will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. The book of John chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. Jesus doesn't say that people recognize us by our knowledge of scripture or by our ability to spout memorized Bible verses or even by stands we take against the evils of our culture. While those actions have their place, Jesus simply says that others will recognize us by our love as belonging to Jesus. There it is. Without love, we fail. With it, we can't do anything but succeed. Amen. Things to take away from this commentary. How would you define the love of God in your own words? Can you find scripture to support your definition? True love is not natural. It comes from God. What steps can you take to become a more loving person? What opportunities do you have to express God's love to those around you today? All right, y'all. Love never fails. We know that. God's love endures forever. God's mercy endures forever. Amen. Unlimited love, unlimited grace, unlimited favor, unlimited mercy. I speak over your life forevermore. Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. And I pray that you spread that on towards others as well. Love isn't meant to be kept to oneself. It's meant to be shared freely. Amen. Amen. So that's the commentary and also the reading of 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Now let us go into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. All right. Book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Here we go. The resurrection of Christ. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel, you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, I passed on to you as of first importance, that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, and that he appeared to Peter and then to the twelve. After that, he appeared to more than 500 of the brothers at the same time, most of whom are still living, though some have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all of the apostles, and all last, and last of all, he appeared to me also as to one abnormally born. For I am the least of the apostles and do not even deserve to be called an apostle because I persecute the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace to me was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, this is what we preach and this is what we, and this is what you believed. The resurrection of the dead. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? 
if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. For we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead, but he did not raise him if, if in fact the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been risen, had not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins, then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied, pitied, pitied more than all men. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, the resurrection of the dead also comes through a man. For as in Adam all die, so in Christ all we all will be made alive. But each in his own turn, Christ the first fruits, then when he comes, those who belong to him. Then the end will come when he hands over the kingdom of God to the Father after he has destroyed all dominion, authority, and power. For he must reign until he has put all his enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For he has put everything under his feet. Now when it says that everything has been put under him, it is clear that this does not include God himself, who put everything under Christ. When he has done this, then the Son himself will be made subject to him who put everything under him so that God may be all in all. Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I die every day. I mean that, brothers, just as surely as I glory over you in Christ our Lord Jesus, and Christ Jesus our Lord, if I fought wild beasts in Ephesus for merely human reasons, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Mis do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Mm. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning. For there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. The resurrection body. But someone may ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body will they come? How foolish what, what you sow does not come to life unless it dies. When you sow, you do not plant the body that will be, but just a seed, perhaps of wheat or of something else. But God gives it a body as he has determined, and to each kind of seed he gives its own body. All flesh is not the same. Men have one kind of flesh, animals have another, birds, have, birds another, and fish another. There are some, there are also heavenly bodies and there are earthly bodies. But the splendor of the heavenly bodies is one kind, and the splendor of the earthly bodies is another. The sun has one kind of splendor, the moon has another, and the stars another, and the stars differ from star and splendor. So will it be with the resurrection of the dead. The body that is sown is perishable. It is raised and perishable. It is sown in dishonor. It is raised in glory. It is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. It is sown a natural body. It is raised in a spiritual body. If there is a natural body, there is also a spiritual body. So it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam, a life-giving spirit. The spiritual did not come first, but the natural and after that, the spiritual. The first man was of the dust of the earth, the second man from heaven. As was the earthly man, so are those who are of the earth, and as is the man from heaven. So also are those who are of heaven. And just as we have borne the likeness of the earthly man, so shall we bear the likeness of the man from heaven. I declare to you, brothers, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Listen, I tell you a mystery. We will not all sleep, but we will all be changed. In a flash, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must clothe itself with the imperishable, and the mortal with the immortality. With immortality, when the perishable has been clothed, clothed with the imperishable, and the mortal with immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O oh, death, is your victory? Where, O oh, death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brothers, stand firm. 
Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen. Love that. Love that. That's the book of First Corinthians chapter 15 reading. So this is a very excellent read. This is a very, very great read. So as we review First Corinthians chapter 15, uh, Paul just goes more further to detail about how the gospel we are saved and that he goes further to the resurrection of Christ. And basically just saying for Christ dying for our sins and come back the third day is always important to us and to, ne- to never let that leave our minds. You know what I mean? And always keep that on our hearts and how important the grace of God is. You know what I mean? And how um, everything has to be effective when it comes to the kingdom of heaven. And the gospel has to be preached and we have to live better and do better, basically. OK. And furthermore, in the book of First Corinthians, chapter 15, uh, Paul talked about the resurrection of Christ. But see, some people kind of argue about this because here Paul talked about how when Christ came back. He first came back to Peter, then the other 12 disciples, I mean the other disciples and then the other 500 men. But when you actually read the Gospels, it kept saying how. When Jesus came back, he first came to Mary and he came back to the women, Mary, Martha and them and what have you. So the, the women that supported and were along the journey, that's who Jesus came back to. Then he came back to the disciples and them. So, um, yeah, a little things there. We, what we have to understand when we read in the scriptures is that by the Bible for hundreds of years, it gets translated every year. So a lot of times the concept of the word is still the same, but a lot of certain details, certain things get kind of. Uh, move like word by letter or certain things. So don't get too hung up if you feel there's a confusion or contradiction. Don't get too caught up in that. You just have to always remember that um, that certain things out of the scriptures did get taken out. And there's so much lost books in the Bible that talks about almost every topic you could want to seek or figure out. So just always keep that in mind. But all in all, First Corinthians chapter 15, it goes more further about the church of God, the resurrection of the dead, and the resurrection of the body. So Paul just talks about how, how what will happen with the dead, how the dead, the dead will be raised alive, and how we will come into our um, immortal bodies, basically, um, immortal bodies, basically, and our heavenly bodies will have you. It would be clothed, and, and so he talked about how in the twinkling of an eye of the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For the perishable must cloth itself with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortal. When the perishable has been clothed with the imperishable and the mortal with the immortality, immortality, then the saying that is written will come true. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin and the power of sin is in the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my dear brother, stand firm. Let nothing move you. Always give yourselves fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not vain. So he's basically talking about when that trumpet sounds and when Christ comes back for his people, how it'll all play out. And the book of Revelations kind of goes into detail, too, about it. So um, because Jesus talked about when he comes back, the dead will be raised. And then Paul talks about it. And also Revelations is a lot more detailed about it as well. So people always have a confusion about the end times, right? Like the tribulation, the sound of trumpets, how Jesus going to come back, the rapture, prophecy being fulfilled. Because when you read Matthew 24, and then you read the book of Daniel, and then you read Isaiah, Ezekiel, Jeremiah, all the prophets, and then you read um, more of Paul, what Paul was saying, and then you read Revelation, it's all basically the same concept. The details is what kind of throws people off the timing of stuff because people want to know about more of the tribulation and when Christ comes back and then the two witnesses and then the persecution. So to this day, all of us still have a lot of questions about it. I mean, you could go on many YouTube videos about it and what have you, or ask any biblical scholar about it, what have you. But all in all, um, basically, it talks about the tabernacle of David being raised up, the everlasting foundation, everlasting generation, everlasting people. 
So those who are with the Most High, the one third, the one four four, the chosen twelve tribes of Israel, the righteous Gentiles outside the twelve tribes, all tribes, all nations, all peoples, all four corners of the earth, we will all be the everlasting foundation. Basically, we'll be raised up when the destruction, everything goes down the drain. So um, I know I went a lot with that, but I'm just saying, like, it's it's so much that, that that has to come to pass when it comes to prophecy being fulfilled. There's so much that's that goes that goes about it. To where even if we research or just read the word, um, people still won't have all their answers uh, satisfied. You know, in real life, like when it comes to past and that prophecy really fulfills, we're going to see it clear as day and we'll know. You know what I mean? So with the scriptures that we're given now, we go off of what we know now. Okay, we do know for sure Jesus will come back. He will come back for a church with no spot, blemish, or wrinkle. The tabernacle of David, everlasting people, everlasting generation. Israel will be restored, everlasting joy. Names on the ra- written, names written on the Lamb's book of life. Treasures in heaven, crowns, the five crowns in heaven. Uh, immortal bodies, like heavenly like bodies. Glorification with Christ. Uh, Israel being united as the days of old, being tight knit once again and forevermore. So it's all the same concept. Don't get so hung up about details and the wrath and all that. Because, of course, like Zechariah, Joel, all the prophets and John, they saw the wrath, the tribulations, the four horsemen, um, the whore of Babylon, the mark of the beast, 666. They all saw all that. They saw it all. You know what I'm saying? So we're, we're going to, we're the, revela- we're the um, generation that's going to see it all too. Okay. So prophecy wise man let us keep let's keep living for the lord and keep fearing him man because his son is coming back man you want to be on the right side of it you want to hear the well done good and faithful servant you do not want to hear depart from me. i never knew you you do not want to hear that man and you do not want to uh go into hell eternal fire um the lake of fire man that that is a very and I, don't, I man, for real, I pray was listen to this man. We all make it, man, seriously, and that we all work towards it as well, and we all get it together and gather as much people as we can about this, man, because this world is going in a very bad, very bad direction, man. And we could still save some souls and teach the gospel to many people and spread it. All right, so let us keep saving souls in these last days, Amen. Yes, yes, y'all. So that is the book of First Corinthians, chapter fifteen, reading. Okay. Now, before I get into the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 reading, I'm going to read this commentary within 1 Corinthians 15, okay? So here we go. Okay, today's Bible reading, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 35 through 58. Recommended reading, the book of Ezekiel chapter 48, verses 1 through 35. The book of John chapter 17, verses 1 through 24. And also the book of Philippines, Philippians chapter 1. Verses 18 through 26. All right. Excuse me. The title of this commentary is Eternity. All right, here we go. Nancy and I have spent some wonderful moments with our family and friends at Christmas or on vacation or at simple times in the family room after dinner. If we said those enchanting words, it doesn't get any better than this. No matter how difficult your life has been, you said the same thing about some magnificent moment, haven't you? Maybe it was recently. Maybe it was long ago. Maybe you can barely remember. It doesn't get any better than this. Can you think of even one time in your life when even for one, even for a fleeting moment, that seemed to be true? Well, it isn't true. The most ordinary moment on the new earth will be greater than the most perfect moments in this life. Those experiences you wanted to bottle or hang on to but couldn't. It can get better, far better than this, and it will. Life on the new earth will be like sitting in front of the fire with family and friends, basking in the warmth, laughing uproariously, dreaming of the adventures to come, and then going out and living those adventures together with no fear that life will ever end or that tragedy will descend like a dark cloud, with no fear that dreams will be shattered or relationships broken. Here's what the Apostle John recorded near the end of the Bible. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain. For the old order of things have passed away, has passed away. 
He who has seated on the throne, he who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Then he said, write this down for these words are trustworthy and true. The book of Revelation, chapter 21, verses uh, chapter one, verse one, and also three through five. These are the words of King Jesus. Count on them. Take them to the bank. Live every day in the light of them. Make every choice in light of Christ's certain promise. We were all made for a person and a place. Jesus is the person. Heaven is the place. If you know Jesus, I'll be with you in that resurrected world. With the Lord we, we love and with the friends we cherish. We'll embark together on the ultimate adventure in a spectacular new universe awaiting our export, exploration, exploration and dominion. Jesus will be the center of all things and joy will be the air we breathe. And right when we think it doesn't get any better than this, it will. Quote, unquote, Randy Alcorn. Amen. Things to take away from this commentary. What does it mean when Christ says, I am making everything new? What mental images do you have of the new earth? Do you long to dwell in the new earth and to be in the presence of Christ? What steps can you take to fire your imagination and increase your desire for the world to come? All right. So eternity, everlasting life, eternal life, a hundredfold. The promises of Jesus. Amen. Yes, yes. So let us keep working hard for the kingdom of heaven. Let us keep doing Father's will forevermore. Okay. All the way to the end. Amen. Let's endure to the end and be saved, y'all. Yes, yes. I want to see y'all at the wedding feast of the Lamb. I want to see y'all in your robes and all that's sealed, man. I want to see y'all rejoicing. Amen. It's all said and done because we will endure and get through this. In the name of the Lord. Amen. All right. So. That is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and his commentary. Now we will read the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16, okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 16, here we go. The collection for God's people. Now about the collection for God's people, do what I told the Galatian churches to do. On the first day of every week, each one of you should set aside a sum of money in keeping with his income, saving up so that when I come, no collections will have to be made. Then when I arrive, I will give letters of introduction to the men you approve and send them with your gift to Jerusalem. If it seems ad advisable for me to go also, they will accompany me. Personal request. After I go through Macedonia, I will come to you, for I will be going through Macedonia. Perhaps I will stay with you a while or even spend the winter so that you can help me on my journey wherever I go. I do not want to see you now and make only a passing visit. I hope to spend some time with you if the Lord permits. But I will stay on at Ephesus until Pentecost because a great door of effective work has opened to me and there are many who oppose me. If Timothy comes, see to it that he has nothing to fear while he is with you, for he is carrying on the work of the Lord just as I am. No one then should refuse to accept him. Send him on his way in peace so that he may return to me. I am expecting him along with the brothers. Now about our brother Apollos, I strongly urge him to go to you with the brothers he was quite unwilling to go now but he will go when he has the opportunity be on your guard stand firm in the faith be men of courage be strong do everything in love you know that the household of stephanus were the first converts in achaia achaia and they have devoted themselves to the service of the saints i urge you brothers to submit to such as these and to everyone who joins the work and labors at it i was glad when stephanus Fortunatus, Fortunatus and Achaicus, Achaicus arrived because they have supplied what was lacking from you. For they refreshed my spirit and yours also. Such men deserve recognition. Final greetings. The churches in the province of Asia send you greetings. Aquila and Priscilla greet you warmly in the Lord. And so does the church that meets at their house. All the brothers here send you greetings. Greet one another with a holy kiss. I, Paul, write this greeting in my own hand. If anyone does not love the Lord, a curse be on him. Come, O Lord. The grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love to all of you in Christ Jesus. Amen. Yes, amen, 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 amen. All right, so that is the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 16 reading. That is Paul just writing his farewells and his greetings to and his letters to um to everybody all right and he's just doing a collection for god's people and personal requests and final greetings okay 
I would love to read this in in commentary scripture titled God Gives Victory. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 57. But thanks be to God. He gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. OK, so first Corinthians 16, um, Paul is just, you know, making them request and he's going through Macedonia, then Ephesians and trying to pass on through the winter and trying to kick it with people as well. So. Um, it's always beautiful and amazing to do the work of God and meet so much awesome people along the way and still want to spend time with them, okay? So as Paul's on this journey, he was just going, going, going. And um, the Lord was really with him and the Holy Spirit was guiding him. And that's how it's going to be with us, okay? We're going to be sent out to different cities, states, countries to do this work, do this will, man, all four corners of the earth, all right? And when we are sent out, man, we are sent out. We will deal with a lot of people that do oppose us, <laughs> But count it all joy. But we will also meet some awesome, supportive, beautiful, great people as well, man. We're going to meet some excellent people along the journey. So um, you all stay prepared and work for, towards that. Amen. You work with what you have right now. And then when the Lord calls you and the spirit leads you, you get up and go and be obedient and spread that gospel. You have to go. Amen. All right, y'all. So that wraps it up. That is that is the book of first corinthians okay first corinthians has 16 chapters in it so that's the ending of it okay very excellent read very amazing read overall i'm very happy to read this word and edification correction also just for myself for others who's listening okay it's important that we read the word we understand that we be doers of the word okay and we carry out what the lord called us to do and be obedient and faithful and firm amen be strong and courageous all right so there you have it, all right? In the next episode of the Bible Reading Series, we'll continue the Bible Reading Series and go through 2 Corinthians, okay? So that's that, y'all, all right? 1 Corinthians was a very awesome read and good edification and reproof right there, okay? So let us be doers of the word, okay? Now, what I would love to do as I close out is give all the praise, honor, and glory to the Most High God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and praise his only begotten Son who died for our sins, amen? Yes, yes, y'all, so here we go. Yes, y'all. Hallelujah. Yes, yes. He owes the hope for humanity, isn't he? Yes, he definitely is, y'all. He is the Adam, the second Adam, the last Adam, the advocate, the almighty, true and living God, the Alpha and Omega. Amen. Amen. The apostle of our profession, the arm of the Lord, the atonement sacrifice for our sins, the author and finisher of our faith, the author and perfecter of our faith, the author of life, the author of salvation, the beginning and the end, the beginning of creation of God. The beloved son, the blessed and only potent, the blessed and only ruler, the branch, the bread of God, the bread of life, the bridegroom, the capstone, the captain of salvation, the chief cornerstone, the chief shepherd, Christ, the Christ of God, the consolation of Israel, the cornerstone, the counselor, wonderful counselor, the creator, the day spring, the deliverer, the desire of the nations, the door, the elect of God, Emmanuel, the eternal life, the everlasting father. The faith and true witness, faithful and true, the faithful witness, the first and the last, the first begotten, the firstborn from the dead, firstborn of all creation, the forerunner, the gate, the glory of the Lord, God, the good shepherd, the great high priest, the great shepherd, the head of the church, the heir of all things, the high priest, holy and true, the holy one, the hope, the hope of glory, the horn of salvation, the I am, the I am that I am, the image of God, Jehovah, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Shalom. Jesus of Nazareth, Jesus, the judge of Israel, the judge, king eternal. He is the king of Israel. Amen. He is the king of kings. Hallelujah. He's the king of kings and Lord of lords. Hosanna, Hosanna, king of saints, king of the ages, king of the Jews, the king, the lamb, the lamb of God, the lamb without blemish, the last Adam, the lawgiver, the leader and commander, the life, the life of the world, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the living one, the living stone. The Lord, the Lord is my rock, the Lord is my strength, the Lord is my salvation, the Lord is my deliverer, the Lord is my shield, the Lord is my strength, the Lord is my high tower, the Lord is my redeemer, the Lord is my deliverer, the Lord is my portion, the Lord is my everything and all, the Lord our righteousness, the Lord, Yah, Yahweh, Yahuwah, Yahweh, Yahweh, Ben Yahweh, 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 Yeshua, Hamashiach, Barakatha, Shalom, Shalom, Yeshua, Elohim, Yehosha, Yehusha, Yeshua, yes, yes, Ahai, Yeshaya. He is the God of heaven and earth. He is the father of lights, the father of the fatherless, the father of widows, the father of mercies. Yes, his son is at the right hand of him. The governor is on his shoulders. He is the great physician, can heal all things. He is the carpenter, can fix all things. Yes, yes, y'all. With him, all things are possible. Nothing is too hard for the Lord. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. Yes, the Lord our God is one, the consuming fire. Yes, yes, y'all. He is a too awesome, too amazing. His son, father, son are amazing. Yes, yes. 
He is the Lord of our righteousness, the Lord of all, the Lord of glory, the Lord of lords, the man from heaven, the man of sorrows, the mediator of the new covenant, the mediator, the messenger of the covenant, the Messiah, the mighty God, the mighty one, the morning star, the Nazarene, the offspring of David, the only begotten son of God, our great God and savior, our holiness, our spiritual husband, our Passover, our protection, our redemption, our righteousness, our sacrifice, the Passover lamb, the power of God, the precious cornerstone, the prince of kings, the prince of life, the prince of peace. The prophet, the redeemer, the resurrection of life, the resurrection, the resurrector. He is the life. He is the revelation, the revelator, the righteous branch, the radiant one, the perfect example, the righteous one, the rock, the root of David, the rose of Sharon, the rule of God's creation, the rule of the kings of the earth, the savior, the seed of woman, the shepherd and bishop of souls, the Shiloh, the son of Abraham, the son of David, the son of God, the son of man, son of the blessed, son of the most high God. The source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, the son of righteousness, the just one, the one mediator, the stone the builders rejected, the true bread, the true God, the true light, the true vine. Yes, he is the truth. Amen. He is the way. Hallelujah. He is the way, truth, and life. Yes, he is the wisdom of God, the witness, the wonderful counselor, the word, the word of God, the word of life, the word of Yahuwah, the word of Elohim, the word of Yeshua HaMashiach, the word of Yahweh Shai, the word of Yahusha, Yahusha, Yeshua. Yes, the word of Ahai Yeshaya, the word of the consuming fire. Yes, yes, the word, the true one living, almighty living God. Amen. Yes, y'all, we touch and agree. Yes, we serve an awesome creator, and the Son is amazing for dying for our sins, y'all. Boast in the Lord, boast in the Lord, boast in the Lord. Tell everybody how great the Lord is, how awesome he is, what he brought you through, how you couldn't do it without him. Amen. Give him all the glory and praise, all of it. Yes, yes, boast in the Lord. His Son is amazing, isn't it? Isn't he? His blood cleaned up our sins. His, his blood cleaned up our mess, didn't it? Yes, it did. He made it right, y'all. His son is so amazing. He is the seed of Abraham, promise, seed of Adam, humanity, seed of David, kingship, seed of God, deity, seed of Jacob, nationality, seed of Judah, tribe, seed of Shem, race, seed of woman, prophecy. Yes. In the authority and the power name of Jesus Christ, you are healed, renewed, restored, redeemed, forgiven, embraced, delivered, repentance, baptism, loved, cherished, favored, merciful, prayer, stability, strength. Yes, new mind, new heart, new soul, new eyes, new hands to prosper, new footsteps, new path, new journey, new steps, new light, renewed strength, renewed joy. Yes, renewed gladness, new opportunities, new open doors, new seasons, new life, new beginnings, fresh start, new scenery, new city, new state, new country, new place to preach at, new place to do God's work at, new environment, new everything in your life. Amen. And much more. Double portion, triple portion, quadruple portion, double fold. Hundredfold, thousandfold, a millionfold, unlimited blessings in your life forevermore and beyond. Amen. Yes, y'all. We touch and agree, y'all. Yes, y'all. Amen. The Lord loves you. Don't forget that. He loves you so much. He loves you. He loves you. He is able. He is worthy. He loves you a lot. Uh, yes, trust in him. Have that faith in him, y'all. So there you have it, okay? That is the word for today. The book of First Corinthians. Reading completion. All 16 chapters. All right? So... That's that, y'all. Let the word bless you and be doers of the word. Let us practice it and exercise it and walk in it. Walk by faith, walk by the spirit. Amen. So that's that, y'all. Just pray to God that whoever listens to this message, just pray that you get baptized, repent, start your life over, and that things change for you and turn around for the better. You get new signs, new miracles, new wonders, and that the Lord just keep on blessing you, looking out for you, giving you new dreams and visions. You get closer to the Lord. You keep seeking him and doing his will. You do Father's business for the rest of your life. Amen. Yes, y'all. So what I love to do as I close out is give y'all this priestly blessing on the way out. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you, be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Shalom. I'm Jairus Kingston. I got much love for you all, praying for you all, I love you all. Stay strong. Shalom. Peace.